Right. Back, if you guys can kind of quiet down, that'd be great. That's Just tremendous. <laughs> it's just not such a thing. All right. Introductions. We're going to start with the members around the around the uh, table here, and then we are going to do introductions like we did yesterday because I see some new faces. A reminder that folks uh, that aren't part of the the uh, NCDE member to please sign in. There's a sign in sheet uh, by the table. I think we got most folks yesterday, but we want to do uh, the same thing again today. I'm Kurt Steele. I'm the Flathead Forest Supervisor and also the chair or the current chair of the NCBP um, subcommittee. Uh, good morning. My name is Adam Zerretter and I'm Life Service Field Supervisor. Good morning. I'm Dylan Tabish, the Regional Communication Education Program Manager for Fish and Wildlife. Good morning. I'm Ivy Galing, Kurt Steele's Executive Assistant, just here to provide some tech support. Morning, everyone. District Ranger out of Eureka, Creek National Forest. Uh, morning, Emily Platt, Forest Supervisor on the Helena with Clark. Lee Anderson, uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Regional Supervisor out of Kalispell. Uh, Craig Glazier with Wildlife Services out of Helena. Hello, I'm Scott Jackson, Forest Service National Carbo Program Lead and an advisor to the subcommittee. Craig Gustina, Staff Officer on the Lolo National Forest. Leslie Costello, Research Wildlife Biologist with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and the advisor. Morning, I'm Randy Arnold, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and the Regional Supervisor, Mark Gizzolo. David Diamond, I'm the Coordinator for the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. Hillary Cooley, Fish and Wildlife Service, Grizzly Bear Recovery Coordinator. Gary Bertolotti, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, Regional Supervisor out of Great Falls, Vice Chair of the NCB. All right, we're going to go around the room. We'll go around the outside and then kind of loop back around. So, Toby? Stevie, sorry, Stevie uh, Go in the back and then we'll go to the front. Hi, I'm Rob Green and with photo during this morning on bear conflict and habitat activity issues. Thanks, Steve Dyer. Kyle York and that's WP Region 1. We're going to answer your people. I've served as a I'm Elon Biggs, FWP. Go back. Dave Kim, Foreign Service Bio, South Shuttle. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Prisoner Recovery. Chrissy Lambert, USDA Wildlife Service. Fish and Wildlife Service. Brad Bates, Fish and Wildlife Service. Bruce Montgomery, Fish and Wildlife Service. Back. Jocelyn Blue, Western Watersheds Project. Ani Rice, Ms. Sierra. Aaron and Mr. Bender, the Wildlife. Chat, Great Bar Foundation, Ms. Lambert. Jeff Chu, Friends of the Clearwater. Mike Bader, Independent Consultant, Missoula. Jim Williams, Heart of the Rockies Division. Chris Serene, Montana Wildlife Federation. Lori Roberts, Montana Fish and Wildlife Parks. The Purple PR, I see this Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm Lindsay Walker. Jim Morrison. Yeah. Pete Bidley. Pete Hammers, Lucky Coalition, Council. Toby Boudreau, I know Department of Fish and Game. Yeah, you. Specialist for National Forest. I have a test long trip for this one. Excellent. We're going to try to go online again. Uh, so I'm just going to work my way down. Kim, you can come off mute. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> And I, if you guys aren't uh, able to come up mute, I'm just going to keep working my way down. So Arlene, if you're up, and then Brian, you'll be next. Arlene Montgomery, Friends of the Wild Swan, Swan Lake. Brian, uh, Brian Balmer, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Helena. And Brittany. Brittany Rosas, Final Ground Land Trust, Missoula. Hey ben, we'll see if we've got better connection today. <laughs> Good morning, Ben Conard, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Montana office. Hi, Stephen. Stephen Cross, uh, Wildlife Tech, Glacier National Park. Bethany. Going down to Chris. Chris Forstall, Montana Department of Natural Resources and Conservation. 
Can anyone help me out with that? Tabitha. Tabitha, thank you. Tabitha. Hello, Tabitha Graves. I'm with USGS um, uh, and on the committee, and we are, I am stationed, I'm with the Northern Rocky Mountain Science Center, and I'm stationed up in West Glacier. Thanks, Tabitha. I will remember your name one day. Uh, Kari. Good morning, everyone. This is Kari Kingery with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. Sorry, <laughs> Kari. Uh, Christine. Good morning, everybody. This is Christine Ackland. Um, I'm with the Center for Biological Diversity and their Northern Rockies attorney based in Missoula. Uh, Carly. Morning folks, this is Carly Lewis with the Fish and Wildlife Service based out of Missoula. Michaela. Michaela Myrick, Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Mike. Yeah, okay. Uh, Peyton. Peyton, are you with us? He doesn't have audio. He doesn't have audio either. All right. Patty. I'm Going Patty Ames with. Pardon? Go ahead, Patty. Oh, I'm Patty Ames with Flathead Lolo Bitter at Citizen Task Force. Thanks, Patty. Dave. Hey, good morning. Dave Romer, Glacier National Park Superintendent, NCD member. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Ryan. Ryan Wilber with People and Carnivores based out of Kalispell. Laura. Morning, everyone. Laura Strong, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Forest Service liaison. But I got a I unit. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce, but the uh, guest there. We're just gonna. Okay, yeah, we're gonna go on to John. Good morning, John Waller, wildlife biologist, Glacier National Park. Go. Oh. Good morning, Joe Wiegand. Biologist, Montana Department of Transportation. All right, there was two folks that I missed, one that I can't pronounce the name because it's signed in as a guest. I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak if you so choose. Okay. Okay, anybody else that we missed? All right, with that, um, so what we're going to do, had day one, that would have been... We're going to go into and um, kick it right over to Randy, who's going to give uh, an update on uh, the Montana statewide management plan. Um, could be shorter than what we have here, and that's okay. We'll just uh, roll with it. All right. Thanks, Kurt. So Ken McDonald asked that I present this for him. Um, our update for our draft statewide management plan for grizzly bears is that we are ready to bring that out um, and release that for public review. So um, let me get a little bit of the logistics first. We expect to see that come out um, early next week. If the draft management plan and the accompanying EIS will be out for public comment, um, we'll go out for a full 30 days. So depending on what day they release that, it'll be a full 30 days. And then we expect after the public comment period, um, we'll evaluate those comments, take those all into consideration and develop a decision notice, probably have that out. Um, all goes well, we should have that out by mid-February, is our current projection. So I want to touch base a little on that plan. Those of you who know Rich Harris, um, he did a remarkable job. Um, just hats off to Rich and the work he did and his resilience in staying with that. He managed keeping a lot of moving parts um, on that process throughout through the pandemic and the rest. And so just a real hats off to Rich. He's a, he's a real pro. And I just really appreciate the work that he put into that effort. Um, a couple highlights, the, the plan does um, kind of gather up and take into consideration the two existing fish, wildlife and parks grizzly plans that are out, the Western and Southwestern Montana plan. 
It also takes into consideration the conservation strategies with that we discussed yesterday and we'll have more conversation today, but it does take into consideration those conservation strategy documents and the commitments in um, in those for both the NCDE and the GYE. Um, it, Rich did a wonderful job also synthesizing and incorporating the uh, survey of Montana's attitudes towards grizzly bears, which was done a couple years ago. And then um, a, a piece that I thought was really important was that, that Rich really gathered a lot of essential information based off of those recommendations from that Grizzly Bear Advisory Council that was formed back in 2019 under our previous director, Governor Bullock. So those of you who participated or followed that Grizzly Bear Advisory Council, they, they really did a wonderful job getting into the meat and the challenges of managing grizzly bears in today's environment and future environment. I just think that Rich did a really nice job gathering a lot of those details as well. So it's a nice collection of where we've been and where we expect to be tomorrow. Good place for a new plan. So I don't want to describe everything in the plan, but I thought um, anticipating what questions we might get, I thought I'd touch base a little bit on some of the focus areas of the plan. Um, one is a little bit that the plan does address um, and propose how we would manage grizzly bears where they are now. Um, and it also takes into consideration where they're expanding to and expecting to expand. And it, it is, does give um, consideration to those federal recovery zones as would be expected. Um, but the plan does not uh, sidestep or stop short the discussion around connectivity and the importance to connectivity. Uh, it makes clear that connectivity between recovery zones is an objective. And conversely, in places where grizzly bears um, aren't, aren't likely to connect, and for those of you who followed the conversation yesterday around the NCDE conservation strategies, um, it describes uh, post-delisting zones such as a zone three, and in places like a zone three, uh, grizzly bears in those places would likely be a lesser priority. So that piece about connectivity is a challenging one. I think Rich did a nice job um, giving some forecasting uh, response to bears, both in kind of a theoretical high level way, but also giving a little vision for the, the difficulty and challenges for our practitioners and on the ground field staff who have to incorporate so many challenging things to making a decision on managing a bear. It just gives them some space to manage those bears, but kind of gives some idea on how we would manage those bears in that differential density. So lots of detail there. The plan, of course, addresses as many of those things as we possibly can, and it'll be out for public comment and plenty of review. So we, when that comes out, you'll see all the press release. Um, you'll have links to the plan available on our website. I'm sure Dylan will be working on connecting that to both the, the IGBC and other locations as well. Um, I think with that, I'll make myself available for any questions. If I can. Okay. Any questions among the members first? <clears throat> okay, we'll open it up for any any other questions here in the room. Go ahead in the back. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing as well. They thought on the first very migrant process, so I look forward to seeing how that's incorporated in the plan. Um, one question: Can it a previous meeting said a sixty day comment period? And did you say thirty? I just want to make sure. I did say thirty. Thank you. Did, yeah, I would just make the request that a thirty day comment period is really appreciated. Doing it during the Christmas, and New Year's holidays, or you make some time. Well, for all of us, yeah, a lot of our plates this time here. So we request that we can double that if you're going to start it next week or the next two weeks or postpone the comment period until after January 1st or something. Something like that. <clears throat> Get off the holidays. Uh, and over here, go ahead. Uh, hi, guys. Who's here? Um, I just wanted to echo that comment that we would request it on the CD comment period. Thank you. Yeah, mind, Ivy. <laughs> Folks online, if you can hit the raise hand, that'll help Ivy uh, see what happens. What? Uh, does the uh, plan make any recommendations as to how they do? So it describes the future role and potential for hunting. It doesn't describe that it'll happen or how it'll happen in college. And that's it. That's a, that's a, it addresses hunting as that in, in the place of that sense. But. It doesn't predict exactly when or how that will happen. 
I think Brandy Mike Medell had a question. Um, could you state again? And I, I don't think there is a date when this will become available. I think it's just in the in the near future. Yeah, I, I checked back in with our headquarters staff this morning and projections right now are early next week. Subject to change. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, Randy, for that. Uh, we are going to just keep transitioning, uh, moving up. So what we wanted to do is kind of see if there is any questions on the NCBE conservation strategy um, from that presentation we had from Jennifer in the 101. Any follow-up questions that you guys thought about last night or, or had discussions over maybe adult beverages or anything like that? Uh, we have members first. Yeah, is there, is there going to be um, any discussion within this group as to putting together a, a working team? I know we talked about it before, a working team to go over the strategy that we have and any changes that are on the table currently to um, update the conservation strategy in the next year. I think that should be kind of what we were talking about for those next possible next steps, um, Gary, but if we want to have that conversation that the idea was to kind of have this lead into that conversation. So let's see if there's any other kind of we'll come back to that and maybe start there. Um, I have a question. Jennifer, I might have missed this, so I apologize if you already went over this. Is the Yellowstone Greater Yellowstone subcommittee, are they going through any changes with their strategy or what's their status? Yeah, so they just completed the updates to Chapter 3 for the habitat, and they're currently looking at changes to Chapter 2 for the demographic. Um, the science team over there, successfully like mentioned, they're working on the ITM also and updates to all of their viral rates. So that is an ongoing uh, discussion at the Yellowstone. Thanks. Um, and Jennifer, is, or is the yeah in cabinet also working on their conservation strategy now, or they have yeah. plans to? Yeah, so they had their subcommittee meeting on Tuesday, and they started nominating their tech team to start a conservation strategy. So with that, I'll bring in, because Toby mentioned something to me, if you don't mind throwing out your idea that, that you had. Uh, yeah, my name is Toby Boudreau. I'm in my own fishing game, and uh, I guess um, yes, the Selkirk Cabinet Yak is developing their conservation strategy. Um, it's been on their work plan for many years to actually have a coordination meeting with um, you guys, the NCDE. And I think that, uh, I think it would be a helpful conversation to talk about those common things about bears in the northern part of the, the lower 48. So uh, anyways, that's what I basically wanted to tell everybody, but appreciate it. Hopefully you guys can get together sometime in the near future. <laughs> That kind of tie in there, Gary, with your question. Yeah. yeah. I think we had one on the calendar just before COVID. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. A combined meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So is that something that members think of would be a good idea again? See a lot of head shaking. All right. But Gary, we'll put that on our two list. <laughs> Got it. Now, is that something that we want to have kind of the tech teams to the forehand meet up? I don't know if they have like a tech team like we do. They do. So is that something that we were we we're going to want to have the two tech teams kind of meet up first and then have the executive meeting follow that? Or is, is, it, is it better to have the exact meeting meet well, up? Uh, Jennifer, what? you said next week they're going to meet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they had to start the meeting just this past Tuesday. And they started nominating people for, the, for their conservation strategy technical team. I think they gave people a couple of weeks to turn in their nominations. Any any thoughts on that, members? Do we want to have the tech team meet before us, or are we okay just putting it on the calendar? The tech team meets great. If they don't, we can still have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, Jamie. Well, I was just wondering if the uh, original members on the previous tech committee 
could be on the new one. Okay. There's a lead in our tech committee. Oh, the conservation chair. Jennifer, we have names. We have names, yeah. We have a list. Yeah. <laughs> of the tech team. Yeah, it's just that a lot of the people that are sure. on it retired. Right. And so we need replacements for some right. people who've been on the course. I don't know. David, I thought was going to be. But I'm like, yeah, I mean, I think looking at the previous tech team list, it was like, yeah, half. so we would need some placements in there. But I don't know as far as who's heading that up, if if David or I or um, a couple of co leads could take that on. It'd certainly be going to call. Grab the whole thing or not. Um, like, like the people said yesterday, Jennifer, I think when we were finalizing the strategy a few years ago, we were meeting every couple of weeks for like six or eight months. And so there was a lot of work going into that, but this isn't quite the same. The strategy this time is just contemplating. Might be updating that. And with the technology, we've all learned how to use so proficiently with Zoom and Teams. I think travel would be a lot less arduous than it's a few years ago. But I'd be willing to, to start uh, collecting names for, for agency reps on the tech team. I think everybody, all the agencies and tribes at the table certainly had representation on that. Tech team. So I don't think you, if we can maybe do a similar process to what the Sumter Cabinet is doing, taking names and um, assembling a group. That feels the bear manager. I think the bear manager is yeah. part of yeah. that discussion yeah. last night. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, they made an effort to make sure that they had both management and biology representatives from the various agencies on the tech team. It made for a large group, but it was beneficial to have both. Maybe Scott, could you email out like the last list? Then flag. We got a flag who's been who's no longer with the agencies and needs to play them. Yeah, there were like 40 or 50 people. Yeah, it's a lot of people. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I think in um, case the way you organized last time is we did have, as Kathy said, we had both technical and management um, representation, but there were also these kind of divided and conquered. Divided into chapter leads and stuff like that, so that was really effective in a good way to, to, uh, to approach that. So if there are some I guess that's maybe later down the road. I'm just thinking it out here as far as if, if there's changes needed in, in a particular chapter, maybe that would be a subdivide by chapter. And I think the original intent when we met last go around was to have the tech team kind of look at our current conservation strategy and kind of determine if there was any updates that were needed, right? Because we're not yeah. saying there is, but at least confirm, hey, do we have, are we still good? Are we still current? Are there minor tweaks that we need to make? Are there major tweaks that maybe we want to consider, which would come back to this member board? Was kind of what we, we tasked the, the tech team. I think when we talk about the cabinet, yeah, it seems like they haven't, don't have a conservation strategy, as I understand. Is that right, David? And so, is there an opportunity to to help them along using some of the experience that we have, and or maybe even a bigger? I've heard. Um, an idea thrown out there, a bigger conversation. Do we actually want to extend our conservation strategy, which would be a whole different dynamic? But I don't think I'm ready to even, I don't even know what that means. And to me, that would be the tech team kind of bouncing that off. It seems like uh, whatever that conversation goes. But any thoughts on that? Hillary, it got me some, uh, I saw some glances at me. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I, um, the, I was going to say, reach out to the. I think it'd be good to talk with the chair. But the chair is Ben Connard, who's just the outgoing chair for the Selkirk County. Well, Ben's here. Yeah. He might have a yeah opinion. 
Ben, you want to come into the conversation if you can hear us? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, as Hillary noted, I'm the outgoing chair. Um, incoming is Steve Pazangara from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the new co-chair will be Dave Robleski from the Lolo National Forest. Um, so I would recommend that the two subcommittees get together in the interim before our spring meeting and have as many tech members as possible there. I would not wait for our tech team to form, and it sounds like yours is in flux as well. That would be a great opportunity to share your experiences with developing a conservation strategy. Uh, and then we could each uh, suggest how these two um, how these two zones marry up and what some commonalities might be. That, that would be my recommendation. Thanks. I did not know that Ben was chair. So that yeah, helped. yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that's a good uh, to do list for us is to try to try to get a, a two subcommittee meeting, kind of a combined meeting somewhere in the next, let's say before summer. So, so I would ask maybe Scott, you have the list of the original team from the conservation strategy, send it up to the committee um, and see who is not there anymore. And then try to backfill representation for those folks that aren't there would be our first step so that we can uh, compile a full technical team, uh, say before our next spring meeting, and then decide if we have when we have that technical team meeting. So that'd be the first step. I could do that. Where is Bud? You got it. Yeah, as far as then you got list. <laughs> <laughs> I could probably find the list too. Yeah. 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 yeah let's see how it but it is a pretty extensive. So people be thinking about um, I mean, you know who's turned over in your agency in the last few years. So some of the some of the folks will be pretty pretty obvious, I think, to whoever's in those positions now. But I don't know if there's a, a need to if there's any new entities, like if MDT is now part of this committee, <laughs> subcommittee. Don't think they will have team previously. So you think we can we can I think every entity at the table should have representation so I can reach out to MDT as well. Is there anybody else new? DNRC. DNR, yes, DNRC we have for all papers. Turn over. The turnover for sure. Yeah. Get the band back together again because we said and, and just oh, enough hey, hey um, Scott, Scott was um, isn't MDT new? Did you have that on the list? Yes, I will reach out to them. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, cool. Yeah, Scott, that this is Joe. That that sounds good to me. We can talk. Do you be the guy, Joe? Uh, more than likely, yes. Get a hold of you. All right, thanks. The other thing I forget about the joint meeting, there may have was Jeff Mao was the chair, and they, Dylan, would you, do you remember, was there, there was an agenda developed for that, or it was like a draft agenda for the joint meeting? It would be worth to look at that because there probably were some topics pertinent to the joint meeting that we would want to hit. Yeah, I can go back and I, I'm sure we still have that because you're right, it was coming up and then yeah. it was right COVID hit. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll see what I can find. Okay. So just uh, and I know Scott's probably thinking of this, but I do want to be transparent with the Forest Service uh, side of the house. I will say capacity wise, uh, while I think this is a great thing, I don't know how quickly we can move. Um, with all the influx of acts and laws that have been passed in the last year and a half, and money coming in, our agency, well, I'll just put it this way, Leanne, while we have been trying to increase our capacity over the last year, Leanne just told everybody that she has more, less people in the region today than she did a year ago. And so even though in the last year and a half, we've been trying to hire more people, we've actually gone down. So I just 
I want to give a realistic aspect that I think this is a good thing, but I also want, don't want to give false expectations uh, that capacity wise, we're going to be able to move quickly. And I think it's as much as I'd love to do it, but I do want to be realistic. And Scott, I don't know if you want to add anything there. I just know what we're, what we're dealing with. No, I think that's totally accurate, Kurt. And I, you know, I would imagine most agencies have capacity issues. Seems to, seems to be a common affliction. Um, but I also think we can be more efficient than we because there was a lot of travel involved last time. I think we, having meetings with a bigger group like this, teams or whatever, is so much uh, easier now. Not that we wouldn't have some in-person meetings too, but um, yeah, well, glad you mentioned it. So we'll, we'll move as fast as we can, but there's just a lot of other things going on at the same time. And combining or, or discussing ways to proceed with the self or cabinet. Yeah, that's really smart. That's really yeah. Any, anything we can do to help, I think would be beneficial for the mayor. So, okay, question online. Chris Forrestal said he will be the new representative for DNRC. Oh, great. Thanks, Chris. And can you stand by just a moment? Patty Ames, could you please turn your video off? All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, kind of going back to any other questions on the NCDE conservation strategy. So that was a good. We got a to do list there. Um, anything else for the actual current strategy that you all thought through yesterday? Just, I just have one question. So, um, and it might be obvious to the biologist, but why do we measure at the centimeter level rather than that? Like, yeah. We want to make sure it was unit or male to do. So it's based on a single female. The subunits are based on a single. You know, the average female ankle forming subunit, the ankle. And while we have you, hey, Patty, would you mind turning your video off? We're able to do a tour through your house with you right now. <laughs> situation last year right? yeah. Same thing. the phone and yeah drastically trying to get a hold of them letting them know because my fear was they were going to go to the bathroom yep that's <laughs> that's not cool too. so you just got to click patty you just got to click the camera off please we're unable to do it otherwise we turn off for you but if you click the camera up at the top right you should be able to turn your camera off <laughs> Okay, if there's no other questions on the NCDE conservation strategy, and again, kind of the, the thought process there, again, to reiterate that we've had enough turnover that we wanted to just kind of get back to the basics. So we really appreciate Jennifer kind of giving us that broad overlook. Um, and then what I didn't know is we're gonna have so much overlap and kind of the look into GYE and ours. So that was kind of nice to see, so appreciate that. So the next uh, topic that we have is, is basically trying to get into uh, a conversation with NCD conservation strategy discussion and possible next steps. So I was actually going to kick this to Hillary because I know at least what I was talking to uh, a lot of folks, at least the goals was to have a recovered population in the NCDE and to, I think one of the stated goals, and I might be saying this, uh, and maybe Jennifer can help me out, she's there but one of the stated goals was to actually get delisted there so just kind of a quick update and i know you don't have much but a quick update on where the u.s fish and wildlife service is at with with the delisting process yeah and it's a short update we have uh three different petitions that we're still considering one from um wyoming asking us to delist the gye one from montana asking us to delist the ncde one from Idaho asking us to delist the, the lower 48. And we're working on the petitions. I don't have any updates 
on their outcome or you know delisting status. Um, we're making some progress. That's about all I can say. Okay. So I know that was a general, but uh, general overview, Hillary. Thank you. Um, any questions? I guess from that aspect. I know when I was talking through, are we going to stick with the goals of you know the main goal of trying to have a recovered population and a delisting? I think it's something that I guess I would like to know. I think that was always the goal of the agency conservation strategy was to get to that stage, and so it feels to me like that's still still a goal. Obviously, I think anytime we enter something into an Endangered Species Act, we want to get to a recovered population, and that's always the goal, and that's why we stood up um, this subcommittee from what I gather and all the subcommittees. So, yeah, I, think, I think with conservation strategy, with um, Montana's management plan coming out soon, um, all the habitats uh, criteria being pretty much met, um, some questions, but um, and only minor changes that we've seen related to state law. Um, I, I think we're on our way to filling in all the gaps um, for whatever we need to delist. And maybe this would be a question to Fish and Wildlife Service. Is there anything that you all and you guys is looking at this that the NCDE can do better to help in the delisting process? I don't know if that's a fair question, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think I think it's important the subcommittee continue to come together, do the reporting, you know, try and minimize conflicts. I'm looking at the, you know, we have goal number two is to reduce human bear conflicts and public safety concerns. So I think I think that the subcommittee could focus on tasks that the subcommittee can can do. You know, the, the delisting thing. We need to maintain all of the criteria, minimize conflicts. But um, beyond that, there's not a lot that the subcommittee, as a you know, as a body, can do to delist. And so, I think focusing on reducing conflicts, we have some transportation goals that you know, Highway 93 are going to give a little update. Maybe um, we can hear that from Joe too, a little bit more on some of the transportation updates, things that are impacting bear mortality um, and occupancy. I think. I think it'd be great if the subcommittee could focus on those things as part of their plan. I, I just just remarking on some of our work when when I was chair, really trying to outline those high priority tasks for the FCDG in the coming year. It was really interesting to see that relationship between to David's point, or or at least what you referred to Davis, David's point is you don't stop going to the gym. So there's, I, I like that idea. There's there's a lot of work to be done to to keep all the good work that we're doing, that the engine's running really well. And I, I think we continue to feed that engine and focus on those priorities. And, and Hillary, off the top of her head, identified some priority stuff, the transportation, we still have work on conflict. We still have a lot of energy there. Um, I'm just reminded that it took it's taken years to build this engine and it's it's really easy and, and Cecily and I were just visiting briefly about it's 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 really easy then to shift your focus to the next real challenge the real area and, and the challenge for the NCDE at least what I saw is that a lot of that work starts to then get beyond whatever geographic space the NCDE is responsible for, we, it's, there's really a draw to get past that and start working on those next, that next horizon just a little bit. So I, I only, only acknowledging that, that there's a tug and pull there. And, and as soon as we, if we had an interest in starting to wanting to address things beyond the borders of the NCD, I think that coordination with cabinet yak and some of those coordinations between the subcommittees can be helpful because we're talking about that land in between. But one of the challenges then is that we probably don't have the necessary participation from those who would be impacted by that work outside that zone. We, we don't have the necessary line staff and others in those in those geographies. So this this has been a conversation for years as we go back to IGBC and talk about what what do we do What's, and maybe it's the role of the IGBC, but there, this is this it's it's still a fresh conversation for us. I think no solutions there, just opinions. 
<laughs> that's what this, I mean, we had this as more of an open forum for a reason, right? It's more just to, to see where we land, start having some conversations and see like a transportation conflict, right? We can continue to do that. What I just heard you say is we don't want to lose what we, what we built the engine, right? We want to maintain what we've been doing because that has been working. So we want to make sure we do that. Is there anything else we can, we can tackle as kind of the, I think the, the question on the on the table. No, one of the things um, I'm curious, Dylan, especially or Lori too. Um, now that we have conflict staff, we've been really engaged at least this summer in education events, and you know, as fairs are expanding, we want to get ahead of it. There's a ton of coordination to, like, there's lots of agencies doing education, a lot of people. A lot of different events and how can we most efficiently coordinate that to make sure we're hitting all of those and we're not duplicating efforts and uh, we've been talking about it you know just this summer but i think igbc you know as a group we've got an ime subcommittee that could be really helpful i don't know how you know a shared calendar what is it maybe it's a simple thing but um yeah we've been talking about that there's a need to do that yeah that's it's a great great point Hillary, and it's one of that's the prime motivator behind the summit, you know, where we just right. physically get as many of these yeah. partners together in, in the same room and identify, okay, where where are their gaps, where where are we may be missing in the education and outreach realm, and where are we duplicating? Where uh, how can we band together our resources more? It's uh, I think one of the biggest challenges in the in I, I effective IEO is it's can, can be costly, you know, quite quite costly, and and that's I think reflected in the grant process that we go through, and, and how much money it can take to get even just the meeting together. And so uh, I think efforts like the summit can try to build, but bring that together. But um, it's it's a it's a great observation. Well, the same thing actually. While you're talking, I'm thinking about Greg. You were talking about this now, like for conflict prevention. It's the same thing. You know, like you guys are now involved in, well, we've always been involved in beehives, for instance, and that's a big issue as we go out that way. And is it just wildlife services that is going to do that? We need to, we're, there's a lot of ongoing coordination, but the need is getting greater and greater. And we have many different agencies who, and NGOs, who do that work. And I know there's a lot of com coordination going on, but probably could be better. I also think it depends on your audience. And which right, which yeah, who's, who's going to hear the message the best from who will do it? Yeah, yeah. Thoughts on that? We'll kind of get. I'm going to take us on a tangent here in a little while, which I know will be a interesting conversation. We'll come back to kind of the five year plan, but don't want to stuff the conversation. <clears throat> All right, I'll throw it out there. So one thing I wanted to have a conversation about, and partly because I think even yesterday we had two comments on um, Flathead National Forest. So we are seeing um, an increase in use on the Flathead National Forest. I can't speak for the other forests, but I know we've all we're kind of across the nation seen an increase. What I'll say is on the Flathead National Forest, we are seeing kind of that. 1% growth, 2% growth a year is kind of what we've been seeing for the last 20 years. Um, so our last, our last uh, MBOM uh, surveys that took place in 2020 had us at about 1.3 million visitors annually a year. That's up from the 1.1 uh, five years prior, which is up from the 900 something thousand the five years prior to that. And so I wanted to kind of have a conversation because I have heard some pushback on this one in 10. Um, we started to have that conversation yesterday of the of the developed aspect and, and just make sure that we're still aligned with kind of the thought process that was put in the conservation strategy of. Are we still are we still thinking that that's OK to have a, a an expansion of a developed uh, overnight camp camping area or developed overnight aspect? Kind of wait to see what effects that has. That's kind of what that 10 year gap is. And, and just looking for kind of some conversations around that. Um, and I'll just leave it there and see where the conversation goes. 
So any thoughts on that? And again, I think kind of my, my couch is, and Emily, I don't know if you guys are seeing the same thing, but we are definitely seeing an increased use. And so with that increased use, how do you keep up with, I'm going to say the demand, right? Um, of just the recreating public. And I know when we talked during COVID, we saw a huge influx and luckily we've seen it kind of come back down to kind of pre-pandemic or a little bit more than pre-pandemic levels, but still seeing an increased use continually every single year uh, moving forward. So thoughts on that? So, so let maybe add that not only to national forest, but national park, Glacier National Park, um, state lands, um, even private lands that are within the NCDE and the surrounding zones and what those potential expanded uses and increased uses of social um, impacts are to make this comparison. Yeah, exactly. I think there's a discussion to be had too around if, if we don't manage and provide, which might require and obligate a little expansion, we don't have a place for folks to go. The, the thing that we were seeing that could be some of the most impactful is all of the dispersed camping and the dispersed recreation that's occurring. Not all of that dispersed use is because there aren't opportunities available. Those users seek that different experience, but but still the, the number of dispersed sites which with no infrastructure and control for refuse and garbage and attractants and rules, and that, there's just no control. There might be a little trade off with a little more development to offset those costs too. Yeah, and I should mention we did, and I think this is a good stroke of business and maybe something that we can tie in. All of Region 1 currently has the same uh, food storage order closure. I think that was a good stroke of business. So no matter where we go uh, on national forest lands, it's all the same. That we used to have each forest had their own and there were slightly nuances. So I think we're moving into that. And I don't know if the state of Montana um, has any desire to maybe align even more again our recreating public doesn't really see a lot of them don't see the <laughs> the differences of public lands maybe minus the park i think the park is pretty well established there uh, because of <laughs> because of the gate that you drive through but uh, minus that public land it seems like at least what i'm talking to uh, most folks are thinking public lands are public lands and then we have a whole different dynamic going on with uh, in the flathead valley with warehouser land getting sold to Southern Pine, which now then got sold to Flathead River Ranch and it's being some part out. So um, just wondering thoughts again, just trying to figure out how as we continue to get influx, like you said, Randy, across all public lands, how that works and what can we do better moving forward to ensure conservation of bears is uh, continues to happen. Go ahead, John. Yeah, just a couple thoughts on that. We have to remember that one in 10 applies to the PCA. And the PCA is the core of grizzly bear conservation. That's where we committed to maintaining an environment that allows grizzly bears to thrive. It could be that we won't be able to meet public demand within the confines of the PCA. Uh, I think we have to just be really careful about how we approach that. I think the one in 10 allows an opportunity for some increases, but again, to look at how it impacts the grizzly population over the long term. There's probably opportunity to meet some of that latent recreational demand outside the PCA, uh, but I, I get pretty nervous when we start making inroads into the PCA. Chris, go ahead, Chris. I just wanted to kind of agree with all the thoughtful conversation that's going on here about recreation, both developed and then dispersed, certainly on state lands. We're seeing those those pressures in terms of dispersed campers and even just flat out squatters since a number of our lands, at least up here in the Northwest are near whitefish or um, Kalispell. And uh, there's definitely some trade-offs to be had in terms of the uh, the educational component 
and uh, infrastructure to give to people to uh, di yeah, dispose of their attractants or at least manage them in a very safe way. But 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 certainly uh, state lands are I think are very much reflective of what's going on on Forest Service lands in terms of the recreational pressures and also the the kind of uh, commercial recreation proposals that we're seeing an increase of on state lands as well. Uh, I'm not. I wasn't sure if the Forest Service is seeing the, an increase in the proposals for commercial developed, um, not just recreational sites, but recreational activities. But we're certainly seeing that on state lands. Yeah, I would say the Flathead. Again, I don't want to speak for Emily or Seth and uh, Carolyn or Greg and her steps, uh, but the Flathead is definitely seeing a, a potential. And again, I think that's where that economic growth, right? When you have a valley that's growing one to two percent per year, um, and we have a valley that is anticipating a one to two percent growth per year for the next hundred years, <laughs> that shows that folks probably want to invest, right? Versus a, a an area. So Montana is an interesting place right now, um, but we're definitely seeing that as well. I don't know necessarily uh, the outfitter and guide side of the house, or at least providing opportunities. Um, we're, we're moving forward, as mentioned yesterday, we're moving forward with uh, issuing some temporary special use permits to see if there's actually a need there. Um, so that's been an interesting dynamic. So, because uh, you don't know if there's a need, so you don't want to just jump into issuing a five or 10 year permit. So we issue a, a year permit to see if there's a, a established need there, and then we can go forth with that. Um, but it's just been an interesting, yeah, challenge, and we're definitely seeing a, a more, interest in that and they will no okay um <clears throat> so again being new to all this and you know this is a question uh hillary and jennifer for for within our own agency is you know, there's the the work that this subcommittee is done and you know, planning that uh, we're talking about now uh, <clears throat> how much has this been considered in our own species status assessment or SSA, or could be, <clears throat> excuse me, where we look at you know, future recreation, population growth, climate, uh, and those kinds of uh, future projections or scenarios, um, or updates to the SSA that could you know, perhaps include that even more to the extent it's not, and you know, how that could help this group of you know, how work that's done in these subcommittees and the conservation strategies um you know lines up with our ssa are they informed the discussion in our ssa and then in recreation of the private lands particularly um and, and all of the federal lands too um however we do recognize some gaps in our knowledge and there's some of that data that we want to dive into deeper in the next version of our ssa and also, um, we, you know, we're always an ongoing conversation with the Forest Service and our partner about some need for some additional information. Um, a good example would be um, we stopped using measuring or buffering around high use trails because we didn't have good information about what is a high use trail and what uh, those impacts are. Um, yeah, so we do have some needs for some additional information, I think, to. Be able to apply the best available science. Um, and the same goes for this, this developed site. Um, you know, it's based on what was done in the past because we don't have a structure. Um, so I think we could dive deeper into that. I think that's something the technical team could do um, when it really needs to right answer some of those questions. So, Cecily, this might be a question for you because I know we've been tracking grizzly bears, right? So again, I just threw out some numbers. We're seeing an increase in use and have been for a lot of years. Are we seeing, is is it tracking with the increased use, is it tracking with increased conflict? Granted, we know there's increased conflict down below because as the bears expand, right? But if actually users on the forest or on public lands, is there kind of the same tracking aspect of, that's occurring in the last 15, 20 years? Um, well, we're, we're our conflict database uh, where we actually count the number of conflicts 
um, so that we can track it over time is a relatively new thing that we've just begun in the last couple of years. Okay. Um, but we would have information about bears that are, are on the air and whether or not they were involved in a conflict. Um, and I would say that for the most part, the conflicts that we see are not on the public land. Um, and, but I would also say that the impact of recreation and a lot of, a lot more people using public land is not just about conflict. Um, and that's the, that's the aspect of the science that we really kind of don't know um, how much more increased use is affecting bear behavior and bear access to resources and that sort of thing. And so um, it probably is a place where now that we have uh, a lot more availability of GPS data where we could study that in a way that we previously couldn't. Um, maybe the first time around when these sort of questions were being asked, a lot of it was based on VHF data, um, which has some limitations. But with, with, uh, with GPS data, I think you have a, a way to look at their behavior a little bit more precisely. We better off, from your perspective, maybe this is maybe you don't know, but are we better off concentrating our use, right? Again, getting back to that dispersal, I'll throw out Hall Lake Lodge because everybody knows that in the room. Are we better off? You already have a high use area, right? It's already high use. If we increase that use by 5%, is there some threshold that we're going to pass that makes that high use because it's a little bit higher? Worse for bears. I mean, that's that's what I struggle with when I hear folks on the bear side of the house push back on on something like Holland Lake Lodge in terms of the ecological side of the house. I don't want to speculate on the answer to that question, yeah. but I think if we have a particular, you know, specific question that we want to answer, I think we probably have data to try to tackle yeah. it, and that that would be where this committee you know, kind of articulates a question to the science team and says, we we need an answer to this. Okay. And so I kind of want to know exactly what you're asking. And then we see if we can develop some science behind it. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I see someone's up. Katie on the go ahead, Katie. Hey you guys, Katie Stevens, district manager for BLM. I was just gonna speak to exactly what Kurt just said, I think. Um, you know, at a certain level of human population pressure, I think those recreation facilities can be essential to helping us guide human use to the places that can best handle it. But, you know, there's a certain demand that we can't avoid just by avoiding constructing facilities. So I think that's the challenge for all of us is what's the right balance there between, you know, supporting demand in the right places versus allowing dispersed incursion because of demand into the wrong place or the less ideal places. So interested in continuing pretty robust discussions on that and BLM obviously seeing the same sort of exponential growth in recreation over the past five to 10 years that all the other agencies are talking about. Thanks. Okay. Kurt, I might follow up because John Waller wrote into the chat that everyone can't see. And so I'll read this for you, John. And then if you want to follow up, go ahead. But John wrote, agencies can take an active role in shaping recreational demand, not just reacting to it. So just wanted the group to be able to recognize that comment. Yeah, John, you want to elaborate on that? So I'll, I will say where that goes is like a permit process, right? I think what, what Dave's done on the park, I would say for the National Forest, it's a little more challenging. We don't have as... Uh, we have a lot more entry points, I'll just put it that way. But can you elaborate on that a little bit more, John? Kurt, I can give you maybe one example from the GYE. Um, so when they decided to allow an increase in dispersed sites recently in a very limited capacity, it was also saying this is going to be accompanied by a closure of um, so if you increase a campground and add a campground here, we are then also going to close this area to disperse camping. 
so that you are concentrating the use and reducing that potential and not just adding to the problem, knowing that you could have increased dispersed camping along with it. You know, so that's just one example. And I think there's a lot of opportunities to, you know, to think outside the box about balance. Thank you for that. Just that I think um, we could use some help. The portions could use some help to think about what that looks like. And so having the discussion here with um, all our different partners and interests would be really helpful. So we're not just doing that. Um, it would be nice to know what other folks are doing and what's working and how it actually affects the bear. So it'd be nice to try something and actually track it and see what see what happens so we can learn different things like that. I, yeah, I just wanted to to comment that um, I think it's I think this is a really interesting and, and valuable set of questions given the growth in these areas. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. OK. Um, and and just to note that that um, these are hard questions in many ways. Um, in in part, the I think one of the and, and John has done a lot of work on these uh, questions too. But one of the biggest challenges, and and I think you guys know about this also, who have been just trying to track recreation and figuring out how to do it, is 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 the tracking of the recreation, and particularly all of those dispersed uses are really hard to track in any kind of quantitative way. So um, mostly, I just wanted to note that makes analysis difficult and. Uh, it can be something that requires some specific effort in order to be able to to match those things up well. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> we've when we've had these discussions about high use trails, we we always come back to the question of well, how do you define it? How do you even measure it? Do you actually have data that that shows that this? This particular trail gets this amount of use, and this other trail gets this other amount of use. If we don't have those as inputs into our analysis, it makes it very difficult to understand the real impact. But isn't there more cell phone data and stuff like that lately? I know some researchers, recreation researchers, have been using data in super crazy cool new ways to track where people actually are from their cell phone pings, which is creepy but effective. <laughs> Oh, it seems like we could take advantage of that to try to just incorporate that new way of using data to look at where people actually are out there because we, we don't have that. No. I'm not super hopeful that we'll get it anytime soon, though it will be cool. So it seems like just taking advantage of other stuff that's out there would be helpful. So those of you that may not know me, my name is Chris Servine and I was the Grizzly Recovery Coordinator for 35 years. And I'd like to speak to this issue a little bit in a more expanded way. First of all, there is published literature on the effects of human recreation on wildlife and the dispersal impacts that occur to grizzly bears, to elk, to multiple other species from recreation. It's not the outfit. So we don't need to recreate that and study it in the NCD. It already exists. And as Cecily said, it's difficult to get, but studies have already looked at this and seen that most animals avoid people, not only for motorized trails, but for non motorized trails. So that's something that's ongoing. As you put more people into bear habitat, you're going to get more, more avoidance, and the bears are going to be trying to go somewhere else to avoid all those people. And they're going to go into places that are less secure. And they're going to be in conflict with people in other places. So putting more people into bear habitat does displace bears and they avoid people. Related to the conservation strategy issue, years ago, when we developed the initial conservation strategy idea, the idea with habitat was to establish what's called the habitat baseline. That is that we identified the habitat that was in place that allowed the population to recover. And we put in place management systems to maintain that habitat in order to maintain a healthy population to delist the bear and get them to the point of recovery. So let me repeat that. The idea is a baseline of what was in place and to maintain that baseline, 
after the bears became healthy in order to maintain the population in that healthy status from then on. The idea of the one in 10, the erosion of some of the habitat security came from some ideas from the Forest Service that they wanted some ability to, to change recreational impacts or maybe uh, do something here and there. And the examples that were always used in the conservation strategy teams that we had, both in Yellowstone and the NCDE, were minor variations. You might want to put in a new loop in a campground or maybe an outhouse at a trailhead in order to keep it clean. Little things like that were the examples that were used for the one in 10. And when we all thought about that as biologists and managers, we thought, well, those things probably are okay, but only one every 10 years so that we don't have an accelerated level of development on the habitat. Now, the habitat baseline applied to the primary conservation area, the recovery zone, the place where the core of the grizzly bear habitat and the grizzly bears were. And it was fundamental to maintain that secure habitat from then, when the conservation strategy was developed into the future, and not to change the impacts on public land in those areas. This is particularly important today as we see accelerated development of private land all around and even within the PCA in the recovery plan. We see lots of sales and developments, and nobody's tearing homes down. They buy a 20 acre property, they put it up in the swan or the Rocky Mountain Front or the Blackfoot Valley or the Flathead Valley. All those places on private land are becoming increasingly unavailable and risky for grizzly bears. That highlights the importance of public land and making sure that public land is carefully managed without increasing developments so that that secure habitat remains for that healthy grizzly population. And what troubles us, and when I say us, I say many managers and biologists, is that we're seeing interest in the public land managers to develop public land and bring more people into those public lands. Now, some of that is couched in the terms that we just heard, you know, maybe we could, uh, we could um, you know, meet some of the demand and prevent uh, dispersed, you know, camping. Um, but some of that is stuff like Holland Lake, it's a disaster for grizzly bears. That would bring 35,000 additional user days per year into the recovery zone in a very prime grizzly bear area. And that's on public land. And then we see the idea of development, idea of, development of cabin sites in remote areas to bring people in and allow them to, to hike from cabin to cabin, places where we don't have, you know, that kind of development now. These things are erosions of the habitat baseline. Now, the importance of the habitat baseline is that in order for the Fish and Wildlife Service to delist the grizzly bear, they have to demonstrate the existence of adequate regulatory mechanisms both with population issues and with habitat issues. And if we see this erosion of public land in the PCA through developments like Holland Lake and cabins and new campgrounds and all this kind of thing, that is a clear demonstration of the fact that there is no adequate regulatory mechanism when it comes to habitat. That will prevent delisting. It will be the A number one issue that will say, look at what the Forest Service is doing inside the recovery zone. So, to recap here, there's a lot of biological data that is published in peer reviewed journals that shows that animals avoid hiking, they avoid developed sites, they avoid motorized sites. They do avoid this, and it's already out there, and Cecily doesn't have to go out and recreate the so wheel, it's already done. It's important to understand that that habitat baseline exists right now to maintain that healthy population. And if you, as the managers, allow an erosion of that habitat baseline, you will preclude the ability for the Fish and Wildlife Service to delist the grizzly bear. You will put grizzly bears at risk 
because it will increase displacement of bears into less secure habitats, eventually result in stress on those animals, lower reproductive, lower survival, and potentially more. So I want you to keep this in mind when you think about this whole discussion of the strategy. And I speak from a long line of experience on this issue. I was on the initial teams that developed the strategy in Yellowstone and the NC. And finally, I am not the only one that believes this. There are dozens of us biologists that believe this. And they are biologists from the Forest Service, the Park Service, USGS, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. We've spoken up about issues in the past, like Holland Lake. We've, we've commented that Holland Lake is wrong. And we will speak up again to allow the erosion of, of habitats for grizzly bears in the ANC. So I thank you for the opportunity to comment. This is important. This is not a trivial matter. Chris, can I have a follow up question for you real quick? Yeah, go ahead. So what I don't, this is what I was trying to ask successfully, what I don't understand, and maybe if you can articulate, so the difference between having 100 people hike on a trail per day or having 200 people hike on the same trail per day, is there, that's that's the science that I don't, I think that's what I was asking successfully. Do we have that? I get that the trail itself, if you have users on it, there's, are going to avoid and nails are going to avoid. I get all that, but is there some threshold that that you have if you put more people on that same trail no. that it's going to be? So that's I It'll think that way the trail with just a few people on it. Yeah. Okay. And if you put more people on it, they're not there anyway. They're right. gone. So it doesn't really matter if you go from 100 to 200. That's irrelevant for the bears. They've already avoided the trail. That's kind of was my understanding. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I think Arlene had a question. <laughs> Oh, do we have any more I'll discussion? I'll just make comments on that. Sorry, Elise. I mean, maybe if there's okay. other thoughts on that or perspective. Sorry. Sorry. No, a bunch of people. I don't, I don't have anything else to add. I was just hoping. Arlene, we're going to put you on pause. I think that was good. Uh, Chris just threw out a lot of information there. So any thoughts? I would just say that if his premise is correct, that, you know, we need to and I don't disagree that we need to kind of maintain the capacity that we have right now in terms of overnight stays um, so that we're not flooding the the, the PCA um, with more visitors. But I guess what I'm questioning is, well, if if we do that, if we reduce, if we do not expand the number of overnight stays, then does that uh, keep more people off the trails? I don't think it's going to. <laughs> I think there's enough capacity on the private lands within the area and the edges for people to stay that we are going to have more visitors. We are going to have more people using the trails. And I don't think there's just a single reaction of bears to people using trails. I think the the level of use is very much tied to how a bear reacts to um, a trail, and so and I I don't think that we completely know uh, what that what that um, relationship between the disturbance of bears and the number of people on the trail is because we've never been able to measure. It. So, so let me comment on Cecily's comment. First of all, I agree with what you're saying. That bears over a certain level of use uh, will become habituated. And that's what we see in Glacier Park. So you see bears in Glacier Park that stand right next to the trail or that are walking down the trail, walk off the trail, allow people to come by and get back there. That's habituation. Habituated animals are those that don't have a you know, fear and avoidance response. And you can get that with repeated interactions as long as those interactions are not detrimental. But we know that outside Glacier National Park, the controls on human behavior are a lot less than they are in the park. Thank and you. if bears are in a, outside the park and they're habituated, they are highly at risk from any number of things, from people carrying nine millimeters all the time. And when they see a bear, they start shooting. 
which we've seen. And, you know, those bears can be really at risk and they're more likely to be getting close to people, coming into camps, coming into outfitter camps, walking down the trail, close to people. People become very nervous about this and the resulting interaction can often be risky for bears. So we can have habituation and that will occur. It's more likely in a controlled situation like a park, outside the park, habituation is not necessarily. Kurt Jamie had his hand up for a while. Oh, sorry, Jim, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that I agree with Chris and uh, reiterate what Joe Waller said. Uh, the primary conservation area isn't that big an area. It's, it's really quite small if you look at it the way it sits in the landscape. Um, and one thing I was wondering, uh, if you have some discussion about, you know, there's never been any talk about managing the actual landscape for people. For example, uh, I remember we had a family group of grizzlies, you know, on Pyramid Pass in Sealy, and there was all this talk of, you know, going up there chasing the bear, going up there trapping for the bear, and all this stuff. And in my group, well, what's supposed to trip? You know, uh, we might in the future have to start thinking about closing some trails and managing some trails for impact by people. Especially as we learn more about seasonal needs, food needs, habitat needs, that kind of stuff. And just on a side, uh, uh, there's so many dang bike trails popping up all over the place. Uh, and some of them are scaring the heck out of me because they're going through such remote country, uh, especially on the south end here. And there's all sorts of talk of expanding all these additional bike trails here on the south end of the ground. Uh, it, I just think we need to start thinking a bit more about maybe ranking trails for danger. Because I can think of a couple of bike trails in the Lincoln area that I would not go down. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, we've already had multiple encounters on some of these trails. Just not a thing to think about. But, you know, I, I haven't seen much talk about managing the interior of the PCA and not managing bears, managing the people. <laughs> well, so I got Arlene that's been waiting patiently, but I want to come back to any member real quick. Okay, I'm going to go Arlene, then I saw we'll just kind of go, was Keith first, we'll just go around after Arlene. Um, yes, I, I, um, my, my question, I guess, and concern is it, I appreciate, um, Chris's, uh, um, look back at how that one in 10 came into the conservation strategy, one development in t every 10 years, um, which it's not, it seems like things like Holland Lake Lodge and other th other um, developments are not really consistent with wh what that was supposed to be. But the question I have is how are you going to determine where that one in 10 years occurs? Is it first come, first serve? Oh, Holland Lake Lodge wanted to expand, so they get it. Um, is I, I, I think that it goes hand in hand with the special use permits also to just have some kind of a programmatic look at where development might occur, where it could be appropriate, where we want um, to have guided services, um, and, and look at it on a holistic level. But um, so I just am wondering what the Flathead and the other forests are thinking in terms of how they're going to go about managing this or determining where this one in 10 uh, developments will occur. Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly talk about the Flathead and then I don't know if the other forests um, want to mention anything, but the Flathead is is trying to be as strategic as possible and looking at every um, potential proposal in the one in 10. And again, you haven't seen very many proposals um, to date, uh, but obviously we know about the one um, we did talk through. Is that really the one that we want to want to do? And at least we pitched it out and we don't know what what's going to be decided on that. So I would say we are trying to be strategic and not it's not just a first come first serve type aspect. We're looking at it and, and Mark, maybe I'll pull you into it. I know conversations are occurring with our recreation staff and biologists to to ensure what makes sense. We're still trying to figure out a way to, 
to have recreating public out there and an increasing use out there, but also being cognizant of bears. And so we're going to bring in from Flathead and then sure. in sure. and that. Our forest at district level, those conversations are occurring. Um, people that know the landscape on their districts intimately uh, understand spills, recreation patterns, and know the wildlife there. And then after those conversations are occurring, they typically get yarded up to the forest level. Um, granted, this is an internal discussion, but those are interdisciplinary discussions that are occurring. Uh, and putting from there, like, my office or right uh, This is just the flag of forest. Because yeah. yeah. you're looking at each bear management yep. doing it. So if we had one, I'll be like, use an example. If we had one that was shared across, I think we would definitely want to have that off forest in a forest conversation. Because again, if you do one, you're affecting that bear management unit for an entire 10 years. So, so far, all the ones that at least the flat has proposed have all been within the flat head. Seth, I don't know you, Emily, you're getting your feet underneath you still, so. I know, I, yeah, I don't know anything. I'm getting curious about this, but I don't know anything. Um, our forest has seen a number of these coming in the last six or so months. We've had an influx of money for um, air creation and development through GAOA law. Um, and folks are looking to spend the money. Districts that have had preparation programs and running funder and staff that have seen the money they spent, so they're looking to find them places to spend it. Um, we have two analyses or two proposals under analysis right now for the one in 10 year increase in two EMUs. Um, a third bit is years away from development that is in discussions. And then potentially a fourth down in Lincoln, but it's unclear based on the current proposals that we have from a uh, commercial operator. So it is, it is happening. Seth? Yeah. Obviously, we have a relatively small piece of the NCD, um, and that's pretty mostly remote area. Um, we're trying to direct most of our growth away from it. Uh, but we have been getting some requests um, in that area. Something we're dealing with. Um, but yeah, we're obviously in an interesting position being right between the, the two um, two different um, recovery areas. And, um, I'm trying to manage a lot of increased use, some of the support while maintaining the increased Greg? We're pretty similar, I think, to the other forests. You know, uh, I don't know that we've had a lot of demand in Sealy, uh, which is where most of the, the PC areas on to the NCDB lie in the low low. Um, but you know, we basically follow the same thing that Flathead does. You know, if we're going to make a change that would affect the one in ten, we would be we would try to do that in a careful way. Um, but there is a lot of demand just in general, and it, it makes it definitely makes it difficult from the management perspective to manage that along with keeping keeping clear of the requirements and standards. Okay, I'm gonna go to David because you had a question before our lane did I think my question I'm so mine is sort of a board of order on the we make sure we have enough time for the five year plan portion. I'm gonna keep us going for another seven minutes and we'll transition. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. It we talk now about, do we have this lack of ability to deal with dispersed recreation? This committee and full IGBC assigned a recreation or access, motorized access task force years ago and published two different papers over the years which essentially were Amendment 19 on the flat in National Enforcement and the prior course plan. And those that was applied at least to some degree on each of the other course in the NCBE. The way it was managed under Amendment 19 is that when, in order to reduce total road density, you had to basically decommission the road. In the words of the task force in Amendment 19, it could no longer, that road could no longer function as a road or a trail. That's how we dealt with it, making it difficult for people to access the forest. 
Now we've revised the plans and we've done these amendments for the other plans in the NCD, and we've flushed all that down the toilet. I challenge all of you in this room. When was the last time anybody in these meetings? I've been coming to them since 1984. We used to always hear when we lack data, we err on the side of the bear. I used to hear that all the time. I haven't heard it in probably at least 10 years, or at least since we started this nonsense of revising the forest plan in the Flathead 2013. Now we have these conversations that are all about how can we have a little bit more flexibility for the land managers? How can we fit more people into the forest? And the simple thing about it is you make it difficult for people and you thin them out. What we have now, as an example, we have the Riverside timber sale on the Flathead Forest that's out for public comment for 30 days. So you better get with it because the comments are due two days before Christmas. Rebuild 32 miles previously reclaimed decommissioned roads. 32 miles. And at the same time, claim that we're meeting the conservation strategy in the forest plan, that we're maintaining the habitat conditions that existed in the year 2011. And all I can say is it's just horse pucky. And you all know it. And we've been having these meetings and we've come to conservation strategy meetings. We've come to testify before the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we all pretend like things haven't changed. What well, has? And I want to see us start thinking about error on the side of the bear. Because we haven't been doing that for a long time, at least out in this committee. <clears throat> and I wanted to address one minor thing that brought it to mind when Chris was talking a minute ago. And that someone mentioned, you know, you could use data that comes off of cell phones. There's published research, it's called Strap. People go out with Strava apps or other apps. They do their mountain biking or their hiking or whatever. And it's it maps. You get what they call heat maps. It tells you where the highest use is. And there has been research and it's published and it's available that compares that to displacement of various wildlife species. So I just want to, you know, let's put that to work and let's, you know, let's err on the side of the bears when we don't have maybe the kind of data that we want to as much as we want. Thanks. Okay, we have about three more minutes just to let you know Please. that you transition. And so I'll go. Yes, sir. So. I saw some hand over there, so I was going with Porter. Um, I'd like to make a quick comment relative to Jamie Jockel's point about managing people and Bear habitat, particularly in PCA, but it's a classic tragedy of the commons. And uh, echo Garrett Hardin is in the face of increasing human population, limited space, limited resources. Concepts of sustainable development is oxymoron. And at least within the PCA, it's going to be important as unpalatable as it may be, as land managers just may have to. Start limit follow Glacier National Park to lead, start limiting access. The other thing for the land managers that are non biologists, the uh, Montana chapter of the Wildlife Society published back in the early 90s a compendium of impact of recreation on wildlife. And I understand it's currently being updated, but that covers everything from amphibians to big game. It's a great source of information. I'd like to ask the subcommittee members whether they think a 300% increase in lodging capacity and the development of a 7,000 square foot restaurant that serves three to 4,000 meals a week is consistent with the overnight develop site standard of the conservation strategy. If it is, then that conservation strategy component is meaningless and fails to provide any adequate regulatory mechanism whatsoever. Regards the impacts of belt recreation on grizzly bears. And I'd also like you to think about how that compares with the recently adopted standard from the Yellowstone Youth Super Subcommittee, which capped increases in capacity for developed sites to 10%. Compare that to 300% or more 
that would be considered by the Flathead National Forest as consistent with the conservation strategy and the forest wide desired condition for recreation or two, which is their interpretation of the conservation strategy. They all say the same. So, I, what's your opinion? Then? Is that consistent with the strategy? So, so what I'll say is there's going to be no decision made on Hall and Lake right now. Why did you propose it? It doesn't. We haven't done the analysis. So what I'll say so is why did you propose it? Because we that is that's our respect, please. That's our respect. Don't to bother me. Like we're we're uh, I can only speak for myself, but it's way harder for me to hear people when they're yelling at me. So just please. So I know I know people are passionate about it. I totally get it. I'm just asking for a little bit more respect. So what I'll say, and I'm not going to ask the committee members to answer that question because we haven't done the analysis on it. And if we actually go forward with the proposal and see an environmental assessment and go through consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service, we can see where that shapes out. We haven't done any of that. What I will say is we are going to transition and I uh, we do have a public comment period at the end of the day. Um, so those who didn't get uh, a chance to talk, we'll have another one um, at 11.30. And so uh, we're going to transition to kind of get to what David was saying uh, and trying to see next steps on the um, and what we want to focus on is kind of what we're what IGBC is asking us. Is that correct, David? I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know how long it's going to take for you to hear the conversation. I just want to make sure we reserve a little time for this. Yeah, well, I'll say if you start talking about just Holland Lake Lodge, I don't think that's good use of our time. I think it's important to talk about the broader aspect, but if we start focusing in on one aspect, I don't think that's good use of this committee's time. Um, I do think the bigger picture is is absolutely worthwhile, and that's what we were getting into, but uh, we started to focus and shift to something specific that is on the Flathead National Forest. So talking to the members, go ahead, David. Yes, yeah, so if, if you want to introduce it, I've, I've got sort of a, I've been listening to what I think some actions that were proposed this morning. I just want to try to recap it as a way for bringing that discussion. Yeah, I think the, uh, and I can't probably do as good of a job as what Dylan and, and maybe you can, but we used to have, and Brandy even knows this, we used to have the five year plan. We kind of just kept rolling over with it because kind of back to what you were saying, hey, we're doing a really good job. We want to continue to do a really good job. And we had actually a list of action items, if you will, that we were doing. Um, David and, and Bill and Pope are up to me, and it's like a lot of it's still pertinent, and I think that's what you were getting at, Randy, where we want to probably continue to, to maintain and keep doing what we've been doing. Is there something more, I think was the question, or something different that we want to focus in on? And I don't have that with me. I don't know if David or Dylan do, but it was actionable items that we kind of kept rolling over for. And Randy, help me out, because you've been a chair and been on part of this committee a lot more than I have. And I think maybe might get a little feedback as well. Yeah, so let me let me try based on the, listening to the conversation this morning. Um, so, and, and also the agenda items from yesterday, uh, because as has been discussed, you know, the, this has been um, a long effort uh, with many contributors over many years to build this engine, as you described it, um, that where a lot of this work has become operational and, and part of routine. Um, work of all the different agencies um, and partners. So, um, you know, Jennifer gave a uh, a summary yesterday of the conservation strategy that has been developed for the NCDE, and um, that portions of that then have work groups that are ongoing. So, obviously, there's the the, the science, the, the the trend monitoring, um, demographic chapter of the NCDE's conservation strategy. And yesterday on the agenda, um, Cecily presented on behalf of the science team um, ongoing work and efforts uh, to keep on top of the best available science and, and answer questions that this committee has had um, for the science team. Um, the second chapter that's uh, a, a cornerstone of the conservation strategy is habitat and that baseline approach. And yesterday on the agenda, um, Kathy presented uh, the annual reporting um, or that or the routine reporting, I guess it's biannual. Uh, and those, and I guess what I should say for for, for this, the um, population piece, those reports are compiled by FWP and are um, on the FWP website annually. Um, for Habitat, you got the report yesterday from Kathy and the reports that she produces 
um, that form a sort of that form some additional reporting. And then we have um, the other two chapters in the conservation strategy, information, education, outreach, and, and conflict. And much of the bare specialist reporting from yesterday focuses on the incredible investment and ongoing work um, in both of those areas. Um, and so, you know, that's the, that's how we're organized. We are organized to keep the engine running. <laughs> um, and then this morning, what I heard was this group, you know, that document is at, a, you know, it was, it was, you know, put into a, a form that was ready to, to, to move forward. Um, and now it's been some, some, some time has passed and the group now wants to refresh the, take a new look at the, at the document. Um, and so an action that I heard related to the conservation strategy was that Scott Jackson was going to circulate the, the tech team list and we were going to make sure we had a complete and current set of agency representation. Um, and that, so, so that's the first step is that we're going to figure out who, who is on that team. And then in fairly short order, I think we're going to need to all you know take a look and make a list that maybe comes back to this committee of what are the chapters or areas or topics that may need to be looked at in in, in a in, in some sort of a revision process. And um, you know I, I don't want to prejudge what that might be. Um, and I don't. I also, David, real quick, I'm gonna. I don't want to assume that we're going to make any substantial revisions. Right. That's what the tech team is looking at. Yeah. So again, so that would be the, the, the task, and you can we can talk about how you want to task task the tasking, but they're going to look and see, you know, what have we got, and is it um, is it in, in good shape, um, and then you know with, with an intent to move forward again. Um, so, and then the other action that I heard this morning was um, an interest in a recognition in this broader landscape and a need to coordinate as the Selkirk and Cabinet Act subcommittees move out on developing their their own conservation strategy. And so a um, some I don't know which the right group is. Maybe you need, we need to talk through this, but um, so, uh, some kind of a coordination meeting before your next meeting in the spring. Um, so you know, that's that, that. You know, again, just thinking about those four pillars in the conservation strategy, and then the teams that you already have. You already have a science team. You already have an IEO team. You're you're restanding up the tech team that you know uh, has. That touches the entire document, and then are there some near-term other items like Hillary mentioned, transportation, or uh, uh, you know? And we just had this discussion about recreation. You know, this this is the opportunity to, as a group, you know, look ahead and say what are some of the shared actions um, that we would like to you know, you know, put on our on our to-do list here over the coming year. And I hope that that is a helpful uh, to you. But. Yeah, it's helpful for me. I don't think any other members. I think you can hear from my point of view. I, I don't know if there's science or research, but I, I do think there's something around this recreation aspect that that would be useful for me as a manager to to dive into. And I don't know what that looks like, Cecily, but um, again, and I, I hear what Chris, what, what you were saying, but it seems like that magnitude there might be something there, there might not be, but it's at least worth exploring from my perspective. So, thank you. Um, thank you. Again, you know, I apologize, uh, new, new to the process. Um, you know, for me, you know, the, the Fish and Wildlife Services Species Status Assessment is the compilation of the science that then informs uh, all of our decisions, whether it be recovery planning, five year reviews, listing D, listing rules, you know, even. Uh, you know, a permitting process. Um, I haven't become familiar with that document, um, but it could be helpful to get an overview of it uh, to see uh, what the the SSA projects for the species and you know, where there may be uncertainties there, and um, what you know, you know, just going through that document, are there priorities that emerge, and how does that document along with uh, the work that's being done here in this, this committee. Do that. Thank you. I have one specific thing, and I don't know if this is the right place for it or not, so you all can feel free to point me in the right direction, but I'm uh, 
curious about, I guess it would be working with state on the uh, mortality and conflict issues in the Augusta area, Highway 200, Lincoln Avando. So I don't know what that looks like or who I need to work with that on. And if you don't have that, that would be But I'm, I'm curious about that. So if people could just point me in the right direction, that would be helpful. Can you elaborate yeah. a little bit? More? At least I don't know what. Well, there's just been conflict issues and definitely some uh, some human bear conflict issues in that area. And I'd, I'd like for us to be a little bit more proactive about it, I guess, to try to um, avoid those conflicts in the future. So I don't know if it's managing grain or, you know, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I could, I'd like to engage. And I don't know what the best way to do that is. It's a good observation, Emily. And a few years ago, Hillary, Cecily, Laurie, remind me, we, we organized a the conflict review team or and we really did as a as a subcommittee dive into okay what are the trends we're seeing in conflicts and and it, it it's covered in in all of our reports but it, it was nice to kind of have it pulled out and really highlighted for those exact observations to be made and i think you know getting that group together or, or maybe just including that into our routine fall meetings or, or whenever it works to just tease that out a little more. I, I found it extremely helpful as we were trying to shape information and education efforts and seeing here are the the, the top priorities that can we can we address the IEO and it, it was helpful from an IEO standpoint to have that or you know dove into those a little more. Dylan are you talking about that work that was done to look back at where all the mortalities were occurring? In the yes. Of mortality? Yeah and that, yep. that was back up really delivered for the subcommittee those action items but it broke it down into it was transportation and uh, country conflict um yeah depredations yeah. and, and we were able to then look at that and break that down into action items around yeah. those component pieces tiered below that were conflict measures education outreach transportation was identified and so we had a we had a short list of our higher priority items to focus the ncp on with that next year or two might be in I don't know how much it needs to be refreshed it's probably still active I mean the, it was 20 years yeah. yeah it was an IGBC task mm -hmm. directed to each of the subcommittees right. so we put reports that we did some several presentations and then each subcommittee small working group to report it yeah it should yeah and it was, and all of that was then brought into our five-year plan. Yep. And it was incorporated into the next, the subsequent years' work effort. Did you jot down notes, David? The, the two, David, if you were identifying kind of potential work items, the other two that I had, I don't know how much behind it, but I heard an interest in um, the IEO coordination. Uh -huh. um, and that could be at the IGBC level, but but I know leading to the summit and also greater coordination communication among information education was desired. I don't know how much of an action item that is, but I know there's a lot of coordination happening. Um, yeah, and even, even like the recreation responsible, which kind of took off during COVID, um, I think we got some messaging out there with that, but maybe making sure that we're tied in. Because that seems to be continuing. We'll leave no trace was a big one for Forest Service, and now the Recreate Responsible is kind of getting some traction. So making sure that we're tied in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good one. What did you have anything else? Well, right? transportation, but I think it's identified as a it's a high priority. That's in our task list, and and there's there's a lot of work going on on transportation, and our what that led to was revived efforts to communicate, coordinate on our transportation, and the subcommittees met a lot, a lot of interagency um, cooperation there, and it's ongoing, but maybe that's a place to capture that. Here's a, for my update, I was going to um, tell people about some work, this, a small working group, interagency, Cecily's on there, Jennifer, Mike McGrath from Fish and Wildlife Service, Carrie from CSBT, um, engaged with M well on the MDT Highway 93 project, and they're doing the feasibility study. They released some draft criteria, draft screening criteria, and put it out for review, agency review. And so we got together as a group of bear specialists and commented on it. Um, 
and oh, I could just give you the update. Um, so the screening criteria, I don't know if I, who, how many people have seen that, but it looks at different corridor options from the, in the nine pipes area. And so it's looking at a, a bike path option and then wildlife crossings, either under crossings or over crossings. And it has um, a, it's, it's looking at pros and cons of each option based on five different categories, transportation, ecological environment, fish and wildlife, the human environment and constructability. And so it's, it's not that long of a document, but we got together and submitted some formal comments. And from, from Carrie, I think Carrie heard maybe a presentation to the council. Sounds like it was it was received really well. Our comments were uh, are being used, which is really great to hear. Um, so now what we're doing, at least um, Jennifer, Mike, and I from the service has been, we've been engaging with the refuge system because it's we've got WPA wildlife waterfowl production areas right along the highway where these this project is planned. So we're getting the refuge more engaged and our leadership. Um, and we're also starting to engage NGOs. That's really important, I think, because this project is one everybody would want to do the best thing for bears, I think, but it's probably the most expensive option. <laughs> and so we need political support and financial support. And we're trying to bring in NGOs and see how how can we do that? How can we get this project like the best thing for bears? And it's not something we're not experts on that, but there's a lot of NGOs that are part of working groups and have been part of different transportation steering committees or you know, like I was just talking to Aaron Edge about it yesterday. There's a lot of work and expertise outside the agencies and we need them to do a, a you know, to see if we can get a really good project um, established whenever, you know, we're not sure about the timeline yet. And so maybe Joe can give us an update when he's, when he's on, on um, when he's up at the agency update. But, you know, I guess I bring that up. That's not an IGBC thing, but it's an interagency group. And I think we would welcome if there's other people that want to help us um, on this little working group. That could be something that IGBC or the subcommittee takes on on their five-year plan. Well, I got a question for you because that triggered something. And maybe Jennifer, I'm going to see you're multitasking. So I'm going to try to get your listening ear there but does the do we have in our current conservation strategy kind of the live with bears right so we want to we want to recreate public and or society with bears is that anywhere in our current ncde and or is it in gye it's in that overall vision statement of saying that that you know you're going to support multi-use or um, I mean, it's very broad and vague, but there's the information, and then it kind of it does prioritize some areas uh, like conflict prevention, and then, for example, like those three, you know, habitat and you're going to focus on conflicts, and it does really conflict and think conflict prevention standpoint more than anything. So I mentioned that because you say what's best for bears, right? And I'll use what Keith said, like so if we start. What's best for bears is to eliminate people out there, right? We could all argue that, but that's not realistic and that's not what our public is asking, right? So me as a manager of public lands, I'm caught in between this push-pull dynamic tension aspect, right? So I'm wondering, again, there's, there isn't desire that I'm hearing from majority of, of the public to decrease their recreational opportunity. Um, it's actually quite the opposite. It's actually trying to figure out ways to increase it. So. How do we figure out a way to live with bears, right? And I don't know if that I've heard. I think Chris, you were mentioning the GYE population maybe is more habituated with people. I think is the word you used. Is that something that we need to be looking into? Is that where we're transitioning in as we continue to see more and more use in the NCDE? Or are we really trying to limit and keep people out? I mean, that really is a, a fundamental aspect. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I'll have to bump that up to our leadership. If it's about keeping people out and putting bears above all else, uh, that's a completely different aspect than our multiple use mission that that I feel like we have. So I think there's a push-pull there. That, and, and it just triggered that when you said 
always what's best for bears. I think there's there's a yeah, what's good for bears. We want to can maintain population, increase if we can, continue to see stuff out there. But what's best for bears is probably to limit humans from going out there. And I don't think that's where at least our agency is at. We're trying to figure out that that mesh. Does that make sense, Hillary? Yeah, it totally does. It's a hard it's a hard thing. It's super hard. Yeah. I mean, on the transportation, you know, when you're talking crossing structures, they're reconstructing the highway. And, I, you know, I don't think, I think that to me, that's a little different. Uh, a crossing structure of bears, I think that would be beneficial to most wildlife species. And it's not going to impact highway traffic. I mean, well, MDT wouldn't be considering it if it's going to, if it's, is going to close the road or stunt traffic. So, uh, yeah, you have to be practical to a certain extent. And we're working from their alternatives that they've already done. So we'll keep going all around the members and we have, we have about nine. Any other kind of to-do lists that we can, we don't have to decide that thou shall do it now. I don't think we're in the voting aspect, but we're, I saw. Am I a I know I'm an, adv an advisor. I'm to sure. kind of jump in on this conversation. So um, forgive me if I don't say this really well, because I've got a lot floating around in my head, but um, we talk a lot about conflict reduction. We talk about a lot about living with bears, um, but I feel like we have a group of bear specialists out there that are doing all the work. Yeah. And the rest of us just, you know, applaud them and say, good work. But where is the real support? Mm -hmm. And where is where is the unified um, approach to trying to get the communities on the edge of the NCDE to really become bear proof, right? And to understand that they live in bear country, that they have to take precautions, that it's on them. Um, and, and I bring this up because, you know, in my mind, we're at the phase where we have a recovered population in the NCDE. And this talk about the, you know, the recreational use in the PCA is really great because we do have to make sure we maintain that. But we're also in a phase where we're trying to get bears into to the bitter root. Yep. Connectivity is is kind of our next big challenge. And what I see is that, oh, well, we're only the NCDE subcommittee and therefore it's not in our purview. It is, we, we like it or not, we are the source population. We have the primary source population for getting bears into the other areas. We're also a really unique situation where we have within our DNA, the city of Kalispell and Whitefish in Columbia Falls. We, we, we're we actually trying to keep bears in an area where there's a large city and a large human population. And in that area, we don't have this big unifying vision of how we're gonna get these communities to really live with bears. This year, we had the highest number of management removals we've ever had, and they're not all related to, you know, um, residential kind of conflicts, but a lot of them are. And I just see the writing on the wall and I say, if we if we don't actually have the example of people living with bears in the Flathead Valley, how can we expect connectivity to occur in the in the Bitterroot Valley? Um, and so I don't I don't know how this committee, who is mostly, you know, public land um, and managers really do it, ha tackle that problem. But I, I, I don't think we can just ignore it. Um, and I would say that the one aspect of it that I think has been really valuable is that the the IENO subcommittee came up with this bear wise program, they're bringing it to the to the larger IGBC committee, executive committee. And I feel like they've been a little, you know, lukewarm on it. I don't think we can be lukewarm 
about efforts to really try to bear fruit communities around these around these connectivity areas and even within our own ecosystems. I would like to see this subcommittee actually discuss the, that proposal amongst yourselves and decide if you want to go to the executive committee and say, hey, we're behind this. And I almost hear an action and maybe don't be curious to know your thoughts. It's, it's maybe a that's more of an information and education aspect or campaign or something like that. So maybe putting a focused effort into into something like that. Um, looking around to see if folks that I capture. Have, have, have the members. You know, reviewed the proposal for the Bear Wise community in the subcommittee. Because I, you know, it's it's in the hands of the IGBC, but we have a bunch of subcommittees that are underneath that larger. How many of you have actually looked at it? Well, can I just say Yeah. Um, so uh, Lori Roberts, I'm the IEO chair for the IGBC. And so yes, back a couple years ago we wrote or we were approached actually by Virginia City and people in the part of words that hey, we are doing this great project and Virginia City is one of those or you know people are coming to Virginia City because they were on the edge they hadn't had black bears, they had black bears. and they were seeing it from kind of both ways and so they were starting to see more grizzly bears coming closer and closer so they decided to take action and with the help of Kim she started or there's a program up in the British Columbia called Bear Smart BC and so this program is um really well done. It's actually run by uh, someone from the administration in BC. And so we use their, their program as a template and we kind of adjusted it more for the United States because it's a lot of differences in Providence and things like that. But then we also threw in some of the ideas that a lot of our bear specialists use. And so the you the basis of the project is you build a community, you build a community or a committee, I'm sorry, bear smart committee, and you have good representation across the board in your community. Um, and so you have community or city members, you have bear specialists, you have um, watershed groups or nonprofits um, or people that are just really excited and, and want to help with bears, things like that. But you have a really strong community and then you have a list of things that you assess your community in. Um, and then you once you take that to a city council or something and they want to go ahead and move forward with it, then you write a plan for your community. Um, and then, and so we have actually written a document. Um, we've been presenting it to the um, IGBC executives for a couple of years now. Um, there are some, we were going to make it a recognition, we're not going to, or a certification. We've now switched to make it a recognition. Um, if, but it's all <laughs> dependent on if the executives want to move forward uh, with using this idea as an actual program that IGBC sponsors. We thought it was a great fit for IGBC. Um, our IEO subcommittee and our working group that we have for this BearSmart, um, because it was really working on the communities that are surrounding the PCAs and these recovery zones and the communities in between that might be seeing more and more pressure. Um, they probably have black bear issues now, um, but they will see more and more pressures having grizzly bears um, connecting uh, recovery zones. So, I mean, I think it's great she brought it up. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, oh, next week. Yes. Wait, yeah, so we are voting. Well, I actually don't know if we're, we're continuing the conversation. We're continuing the conversation, but if there is, and there's different ideas. Sorry, I'll let you talk in a second, Dave. But there are different ideas. Like, do we run it as an IGBC program, or do we give it to the states to let the state determine how they want to run their Bear Smart program? There are different ways to do it. But we do have great documents. We have a whole, um, you know, program set in place. We have put together powerpoints for communities to have. We have a sheet for communities. Like we, we really set it up as a good program that people could use. And so I don't mind distributing. It is a draft still. Well, just because we don't know if we're going to have a certification or or nothing at all like that. But distributed. I haven't distributed. We've distributed it to all the bear specialists because um, we wanted their input on it. Um, yeah. So. So sorry if I know that's okay. That is like well, fine. 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 But I would say that Missoula, and I know that's why Chris is using his hand, they are using the BC one. And, and so they can, and Aaron and Jamie, they're all on the group. And that's why our IEO group from this subcommittee decided to sponsor them with some money for their IEO efforts. 
They have used the program. They built a committee. They did an assessment. They took it to their city council. And the city council said, yes, please move forward with the plan. And so they are starting because you do, you know, it's 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 not a small thing. And they have a great example. You can go on MissoulaBears.org and read their assessment and read their plan. And I'm actually using it as like a way to try to push the program more and more because they've already done it. It's a great template that's in being used here in Missoula. And Lori, so I know Dylan and I were talking yesterday about like the NGOs kind of helping with a lot of this information and education. Yeah. We're kind of tapping in and maybe highlighting some of those great that great partnerships that we already have going mm -hmm. is something that I know Dylan and I were talking we want to do in the future is and, and is that part of this kind of effort? Well, yeah, I mean, there's NGOs on their group. I mean, Aaron yeah. Edwards for Defenders of Wildlife, and they're on there. So that's the thing. You know, you want to bring in the people that can help you in your community make it happen. Not just city planners can go out and do all the IEO. And so tapping in that those uh, relationships and that coordination to then have it be able to work, <clears throat> have a plan, a timeline that will work and, and move forward, I think is very important. Um, and as you heard, there's uh, all the bear specialists talk. There's a lot of bear specialists that are yeah. really interested yeah. in starting it up. Um, but I don't think it should be all on them. Like Cecily said, we have all these. I mean, these guys, you heard the phone calls they get, thousands of phone calls. And they don't have the like, time. And then the winter time, they're looking to take some time off. Like, dear God. But it's been great. Hillary's, I mean, we've already been in communication with Hillary's group um, because they have maybe more of the capacity to do some of that winter work or working with those communities that is taking, and that's what we were trying to do. We were, try, we're trying to relieve some of the pressures of our bear specialists who are dealing with the conflicts, and that's what they need to be doing. The state of Montana needs to be getting those phone calls or whatever state agency, um, but they also can't save the community. You know, we need other help. And I think that's great that Cecily brought it up because at the NCPE, this subcommittee wants to focus on those communities and try to see how we can push that. That's yeah, great. It would be here. helpful to stand up and do it. I don't remember. I think you were talking about trying to get more on your subcommittee. Would it be helpful to maybe send out something and actually stand up more of a subcommittee to talk about this and how we can engage with communities maybe a little bit more? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that'd be great if people want to. I mean, I know there's people from Fish and Wildlife Service on his. You also have the park, right? Yep. And then the CSKT. Yep, and we but, have people in Congress. And people in Congress. So he and he is engaging in some nonprofits on his. But you know, someone, if you guys want to assign a Forest Service IEO person and just yeah. But so, so this is um, so David Diamond of the IGBC, and so just procedurally. Um, next week, the IGBC Executive Committee is meeting in Bozeman, and uh, they are going to hear from some communities that have uh, that are at various stages of doing this work. So Aaron Edge, who's here today, is going to be presenting on the Missoula Bear Smart efforts. Um, Kim Johnston from People and Carnivores is going to describe some of the efforts uh, in Virginia City. Um, and we're also going to hear from a solid waste manager with the city of Bozeman. Um, they're, they're beginning to think about this. Um, so. The, the, the managers at the executive level um, are wanting to hear from, again, parties and jurisdictions and individuals that are beyond the jurisdictions of the, the agencies that sit at this table. Um, you know, we, when we talk about public lands, habitat, there's obviously processes. Um, you know, we, we have the purpose of that conservation strategy and those commitments um, with the baseline uh, and then the individual um, projects and consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service that that you've got that system in, on the federal side um, but on the on the private side and, and on in, you know, in, increasingly we've got individual choices uh, of, of residents and um, landowners and businesses and communities and um, you know so the, the that, that's that, that's a, that's an area where we, we want to be sort of leading from behind and supportive um, and potentially you know hopefully helping um, be more proactive um, as opposed to reactive and reacting to conflict. And so again, this the, 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 the basic concept, and there was a, a bit a working group that Lori led uh, to offer a community, if they form a committee, if they do an assessment, if they put a plan in place and they begin to implement that plan, um, the sort of incentive of recognition from a body like this, like the IGBC, to say, job well done, um, you know, we recognize that that you've made this effort, and we want we want you to get 
you know, some some benefits from that. Uh, so the challenge with that is this is an interagency committee, and you've got four separate states. Um, you know, we have federal agencies who, in our federal system, you know, aren't engaged in local uh, decision making or planning, and, and we're you know we're trying to be mindful of that and do this in a way that, um, you know, again is 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 positive, uh, uh, you know, for for action, but not you know, in any way, um, you know, viewed as as heavy handed. So and and some of the states like Wyoming has already had a program that is in some ways similar um, that they call Bearwise, and so it's just it just we're working on how it's actually going to roll out. But as is going to be evidenced by this panel discussion next week, communities are already pick, picking picking up the baton and starting to do work, and you know, we're looking at ways to to, to encourage that. <clears throat> so David, action items that I heard um, tech team with Scott kind of stand up. Test off, see, take a look at our conservation strategy, and then potentially even tie in with the. Um, I don't play name, and then just one. What's the to the west of us? Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> uh, and stand up some conversations there. Another to do list is to have a joint executive committee meeting uh, with the uh, cabinet YAC subcommittee. Uh, I think Randy said it well. We want to keep the engine running. So all the reporting and everything else that we've been doing, we want to continue to to do that. Um, there's a little bit on the transportation side of the house that I, I don't quite know how to articulate that, but I know it's important. So is that Randy? Is that kind of just continuing to dive in there? Is there some some item there that we want to highlight on that transportation side that you were mentioning? I, I think. Just off the top of my head, I'm not sure the best way to capture that, but as a as an item in a work plan, it might be to to just be there's so much work that's going on. One sometimes it's helpful to know what that work is and where those folks are, and, and just that alone is really helpful to see that, and then that provides the footprint to start tracking that and monitoring progress and seeing if there's a system. Okay, but there's just a lot of groups that have the last couple of years have started really making some good progress or working. Excellent. And then the last thing I kind of heard was where we just turned around was maybe kind of helping Dylan stand up a little bit more help and possibly doing some outreach to communities and kind of building off of the IGBC work that that's already going on is kind of that last task. Did I miss something from the members? If it's not a member, I'm I got it. We got to keep moving. Joe just had put into the chat that there's information on all the transportation projects on their website. Excellent. Public. Thanks, Joe. Is there uh, invitations going out to county commissioners from the subcommittee for these meetings? I probably not. I don't know that for a fact, but I'll say, um, yeah, I don't. Dylan, no, it's it's a it's a good point, Scott, and it's a it's a you know you bring it up and it's something that we haven't thought of in the in, in the change we made where. Notifications now go through David's newsletter subscription list, and so there there should be a um, a concerted effort, I think, to when we announce these meetings somehow. You know, and this might be complicating our notice process, but interested parties essentially, I think it's we shouldn't rely on folks to know to go. You know, especially county commissioner who's new and doesn't even know what IGBC is or what NCD subcommittee meeting would be is almost the same way we. Make sure EAs are sent out to interested parties. I think there are absolutely there are concerted efforts in other subcommittees to include the county commissioners. I think that's a good strategy. That's a, it's a, I would say we can definitely do that. Um, maybe we can just get either a point of contact from each county and or if they have just uh, whoever they sometimes counties just have one email that you send it to and then it gets dispersed out. But I like that idea, Scott. OK, we got a transition. Any last thing? We're running about 10 minutes behind. I got a transition to Randy about genetic augmentation. OK, Randy. Thanks. Switching gears a bit. Um, so this is on. This is a request of the NCDE um, on genetic augment augmentation mm -hmm. and moving our a proposed protocol to the IGBC. So we go backwards just a little bit first. And apologies if I gloss over this really quickly. There's a lot of conversation behind this for, for a number of years. But 
So the lack of genetic connectivity was one of the three reasons cited by the federal courts for rejecting delisting um, of the GYE back in 2017. And Fish, Wildlife and Parks, along with Wyoming and Idaho, committed to ensuring that genetic augmentation, uh, if natural connectivity didn't occur, would be a tool in the toolbox. So we do have an MOU, that tri-state MOU, that committed um, both to demographic criteria in the conservation strategies, as well as a commitment to moving a bear to the GYE by 2025. So Rich Harris, again, um, one of our primary drafters of our state plan, worked with Yellowstone Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team to develop a protocol for the genetic augmentation of grizzly bears uh, to the GYE from the NCD. So Dylan, I think, um, sent that out to all the NCDE members in advance of the meeting. GYE has seen this protocol already and has endorsed that, moving that to the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. And so um, some, some bullet points on that, just to point out some, some necessary pieces. Um, the, the protocol was just thoughtful about what is the most appropriate bear for that genetic augmentation. So it gets into the details of the right bear, the right time of year, the right situation. And it also then describes the right time of year for relocating or moving that bear to BYE. Um, it gives a lot of deference to the necessary communication that has to occur with the receiving land manager, identifying what the likely land manager, the most likely places where that bear would go, and as well as the necessary communication with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who still have oversight of any of that. Um, when you contemplate or vision forward the possibility of moving that bear or a bear, you, you realize very quickly that the next step in this process, with if it's formally adopted by the IGBC, would be a whole lot of coordination and communication in advance of anything left of a, of a bear in the end. Um, so there's a lot of specifics and details in that protocol as to those details on which bear and the time of year and the rest of that. I encourage you to look at that if you have questions. Um, might be able to answer some of those today if you have them. And I don't think if there's any other critical pieces that we'll communicate here. Um, and I think the final step, if if approved by the IGBC is that we would see this protocol appended to both the NCDE and GYE and our conservation strategies as it's adjusted. So, and so that's just talking about those, the genetic augmentation right now would just be between the NCDE and the GYE, correct? Yes. Uh, but acknowledging that the NCDE would be the, the source population and the GYE. So we had a presentation on this. Was that three? Paul? Sorry. Thanks. And uh, it's on, this is online too. And it's online. So I guess what we're looking for, and I think Randy, what you're asking for is a letter to IGBC or a letter of support, or, or at least being able to tell that the NCDE supports this is kind of what you're looking for. Right. Um, so any any member that is against this, I think would be, or maybe not fully on board with this um, or has concerns with this potential. A little bit of a discussion. I don't hear anything. I guess I just transition us to, and I don't. I was asking Randy and Dylan. I don't really know how do we vote, or is it more just a consensus? I don't really, <laughs> really know how the decision making model of this uh, being fairly new to the chair and especially. But seems like if we get consensus and everybody's on board, we can easily move forward. It'll be different if we have a few members that are not on board. So. I guess what I'm looking for is a full consensus that folks give me a, a thumbs up that they're supportive. And if we have someone with a side, sideways thumb or a, a down, we'll have to kind of think through how that works. Um, I would just like to ask the question of capacity of who is going to actually undertake this, this uh, process of capturing a bear to move. Um, we currently are, um, you know, kind of obligated to try to do a little bit of augmentation trapping for the for the uh, cabinet yak population. Um, we have often relied on the, the bear managers um, in region one essentially to do that trapping. Um, and with the very, very busy schedules that they have, they haven't had a chance to do that. I think in a couple of years now, um, our research team um, you know, doesn't really have additional capacity to 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 do that. Um, 
our whole goal in, in our trend trapping is to try to capture as many females to put collars on as we can. So if we were tasked with um, potentially finding one of those candidate bears, it's going to be one less collar bear for our program, um, which I think we should at least discuss. Um, and so I don't think that this should just kind of be like, OK, we're totally on board without thinking about the actual work that it involves. So. So basically what I heard you say is conceptually you're you're in agreement, but how it actually gets done is where the conversation to me. Is that did I articulate I think so, that? Yeah. Might and I don't have an answer necessary to capacity, but I necessarily to that, but it might help to know that at least the conversation, brief conversation I had around um the effort that would go behind this, it, it seemed to me at least to be described more around when when we've described that right time of year and that right potential fair. Of course. I think more about the work that needs to go in advance of that to know that we have a receptive place for a bear and a, and, a, and a land management agency responsible for that site and all the work that goes behind knowing that that's acceptable. But in light of that, when that pre work has been done, it's then taking advantage of that opportunity when we have a bear. So it's there are there are times opportunistically where we would have might have that even to the point that this could take a couple of years before that happened so it, what i what i heard from that at least in the interest wasn't that this would then be yet another item that you then that the team then has to go accomplish as much as we could we've done as much as we possibly can to take advantage of that opportunity of I nothing very structured in that response just that was the sense that and correct me if I'm wrong, that's uh, that's essentially how our Academy Yak augmentation program works, correct? Is when when the stars align, it it works out. It's not a it's, it's not a mandate. It, and correct me if I'm no, wrong. No, it's not a mandate. Right. Sure. Um, but we we're attempting to to fulfill the goal as much as we can. So conceptually, maybe to kind of articulate that. So can we get to NCDE conceptually supports genetic augmentation, how and how that happens when the stars align, we're supportive of it occurring was maybe how we can couch, couch that. Does that kind of align successfully with some of your concerns? Anybody else uh, have any thoughts or concerns? John Waller did just write in the chat and and John, maybe instead of me reading your, your comment, if you don't mind, maybe uh, verbalizing that a little bit. Or if you want me to read it, I can do that too. If you're having audio issues. Yeah. Okay, so my, John might be having some audio issues, but I want to recognize that he, he wrote NCDE and GYE populations are growing closer every year. Genetic connectivity will happen at any time now if it hasn't already. Do we want to undertake this effort when it may not be necessary? Perhaps all we need is patience and continued efforts to secure connectivity rates. Again, yeah, that's kind of more supporting the uh, when the start of line aspect of it, right? And that's kind of what I'm doing. But maybe um, this is Tabitha. Um, maybe I can, and I'm not sure exactly what John was going to say, but I had a, a, a similar thought um, more from the perspective of perhaps um, does, you know, is there a conflict in uh, or some tension in um, moving bears intentionally versus that trying to create those secure connectivity areas um, between those. And, and that's just more of a question, I guess, for people to think about. Very you know, does it come down to um, saying we will or we might? I would say like maybe a we support if it happens versus a we will could be a way we articulate it. I'm looking at Randy because you're the one bringing this up, buddy. Yep. So I think what I think what the protocol describes is how it would how it would or could happen. That it it very clearly outlines if if when given that opportunity, this is how it would this is how that would play out. There is the tri-state MOU and a commitment to accomplishing that by a certain year, but it's underpinned by recognizing that that natural connectivity is we're, we're knocking on that door. 
I, I think it proposes this is way out on a limb here. I, I think it would propose it proposes then in that approach that if if we wait for three years and four years and that we can't we aren't showing that that natural genetic connectivity is occurring, someone would then probably ask, why have you not moved on this other possibility? And it's we we easily could have this piece, this tool in the box ready, ready and in process and working. But the work, it's not no work. It takes some work and a lot of work to coordinate, communicate, prepare for the use of this tool. But this is the first step or next step in moving this. Yeah, and I, I'd add to that, Randy, and these aren't unique things. Connectivity, whether natural or augmentation, based on why it wasn't delisted or what the judge's ruling is, this has to happen before delisting can occur, my, my understanding. So both of these things are occurring, whether it be natural or augmentation, has to occur before we can move forward. And so if this tool is in the box and we, we have basically the, the instrument to do it, implementation would be based on opportunity and or need if natural connectivity does not occur. Yeah. Just clarify, Perry. It doesn't we don't have to move a bear before delisting occurred. We need the commitment to do it if it doesn't happen naturally. So that's what we're basically supporting here. So again, it could be advantageous for us to support it if we're getting into a delisting situation. Yeah, we okay. need a commitment. Okay. That's what the court told us for long-term kind. Well, that just up the ante a little bit more where I would say I think we should support it <laughs> um, from my perspective, whether it occurs naturally or through this. So again, any any member that's opposed to that. And then Brandon, does that take a letter? Are you thinking of a letter or just the fact that we vote and everybody moves forward that we can take that up to IGBC and that's fine? Yeah, I'm not sure what GYE did. I, it, we'd certainly want to be able to, to capture the, the, the this group supported that. I'm not exactly sure if GYA did either. They did a vote. They, they did just that. They, they did support the yes, cast. Okay. And, but like literally, did they just do a letter or something? I guess, do we just take it to the. Take yeah, they did. You, yeah, you know, David? Yeah. <laughs> David's like, they gave it a thumbs yeah. up. Yeah. So, so, and yeah. So, so uh, next week at the IGPC executive meeting, Ken McDonald will be presenting the protocol that, that Randy just described. And the motion that will be before the executives is to you know, add this. A document as a pro as an appendix um, in the two conservation strategies for Yellowstone and for NCD. Yeah, thanks. So again, I I can tell you I support it, but again, I want to be open. If anybody doesn't support it, please speak now. We're not going to do. I can give a thumbs up. Go ahead. I I support it, but I'd prefer for it to happen naturally so that those specific genetics are favored, I guess, of the areas who made it there. So. Uh, I don't know if there's a way to account for that. Like I like I don't I don't know how many years is reasonable. I'm not a I'm not a biologist, but anyway, that's just my preference, but I definitely support it. No. Anybody else have comments? I'm gonna look around the room and I heard Dylan already gave thumbs up on online. So just just remember that any such fair move this way counts as an NCD you can tell. Yeah. yeah. Mortality? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I don't hear anybody with the thumbs down. One last chance. Anybody online, member wise? What else? What I'll say is uh, we support um, moving forward with the option of genetic augmentation. Obviously, again, then we made a point, and I think. Uh, Cecily made the point of don't know how the capacity side of the house, but in general, conceptually, we support that genetic augmentation, whether it occurs naturally or through uh, management means. Does that work? Okay, with that, uh, we are behind a little bit. We're still going to take a let's come back at uh, 1040, so 15 minute break, and we'll get into agency updates.
have my listener, so here we go. <laughs> Nice. That was quick. Good work. All right. So we're just going to jump into it. I see that we don't have everybody back, but we do have a time to keep. And I want to get everybody out there and allow the public some comment there at the end. So we are going to move forward. And uh, Hillary and Adam, you all are up. I don't know who wants to go first, but again, we're just looking for uh, agency update updates. Okay, thanks, Kurt. I just have a couple of, uh, I've talked about a couple other things so far. So I just have two on my list now. Uh, make sure everybody's aware of the Cascades, what's going on in the North Cascades. We uh, reinitiated an EIS process to look at alternatives for um, restoring a bear population in that ecosystem. It's one of our six recovery zones. It has no population in it. We had started this, when did we start, Chris? 2014, maybe? The administration terminated the process in 2020, and it's just been shelved since, and finally it started again two weeks ago. We started an open public comment. We have a 30-day public comment that closes December 14th, and We've been doing virtual scoping meetings. We've had three today, tonight, it's Friday night. People want to tune in. Eight o'clock is the last scoping meeting. Uh, but you can still submit comments. You can look at it. Um, also, you heard from Amber yesterday. Um, she did a great job giving a summary of our conflict staff. Our, we've hired five new staff just this summer. They were onboarded and um, got to work. They did a lot of relocations. You heard information education work and prevention. And so we still have a lot of work to do, coordinating all that, getting you know things set up on the ground, but we're really glad to have them. We have... Um, Amber and Morgan are here in the NCD, or Amber and Rory, sorry guys, are here in the NCDE. Um, we have Becca in Wyoming, she's in the GYE. And then um, Morgan is a rover and he's going kind of wherever we need extra help. And so um, this winter we're gonna be working on um, plans for our education, coordinating with IGBC, looking at potential pro projects, um, conflict reduction projects, and still a lot of our work is on relocation plans with the forests. So relocation for us in Montana is brand new and we're developing plans with all the forests so that we have all of the sites and every all the communication whole process. We wanna get those things um, <coughs> hammered out this winter. Um, and that was it. Um, I have one update, which is the BNSF HCP. Uh, we are waiting on a final HCP from BNSF. They have made uh, some initial tentative changes to their HCP based on public comments. Um, and that, you know, right now they're seeking approval from management and labor before submitting a final plan to us. Amtrak may be covered by the uh, plan um, and uh, are reviewing the document as well. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a, a timeline to be able to give to you to say here's where it's going to be approved. It's uh, so a non federal permit, uh, voluntary process, and we're leaving on the applicant to uh, get us back to the plan that we would consider issuing the permit. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we're going to transition to Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and we're just going to go right in order. So, Randy? Um, yeah, so I had a couple updates. One, I wanted to respond a little. It was part of my updates, but I just wanted to just hats off to Hillary and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service crew. It was, a, I know, a full court press to get staff hired and on the ground and ready to receive a new a new workload. And, and it, you don't see it from the outside looking in, but the sheer amount of communication that went in to from staff to staff communication. Really, a lot of folks who had already worked well with each other in the past, I think that helped. Um, they developed a lot of trust pretty quickly. 
I thought the communication in advance of, of responding to a conflict and then being able to be at the conflict just really went well. Um, I know I worked with Benjamin as a lot. Um, and, and anyway, for the first year, just went remarkably well. So hats off to folks. It's not easy to do. Um, the next piece was also has been talked about a bunch. It's just that Bear Smart community. So it's just a real shout out to, to Jamie and Chris Servine and a lot of those groups in Missoula. Thinking Jenny Merriam, a lot of the names of people I've worked with. So just a recognition for your guys' work. What's cool is that you you wield deftly your your influence. And I think that Missoula community listened and um, it was really important to move. And so it's just really encouraging to see that. So just have to talk to you guys. And I think this edge and others. And there's plenty of names I'm gonna forget. That's the danger of starting to start down that letter. <laughs> so um those are the main things I have to turn it over to. Next, hey, Gary. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with Ray, what uh, Randy said with the new folks on the ground from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, their efforts and trying to put together the pieces. The communication was exceptional, and um, along with them, what we saw with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, our bear specialists on the ground, wildlife services. That teamwork, uh, and, and including the tribes, uh, the Blackfoot tribe, um, that teamwork in the beginning, um, everything new um, from the standpoint of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service being on the ground, and um, it came together quickly. Um, had some had some glitches, which was expected because of the demands on all uh, of us from the standpoint of conflict communication, education, and prevention um, came together well, and by the end of the season, it was just exceptional. And I give credit to Wildlife Services, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the tribe, and our, our field staff there, um, just exceptional. Um, and next year will even be better because we found um, where we can do, do more, um, work together better, um, and uh, with the expansion of bears, out on the brewery, trying to figure out what to do with those and as far as relocations when we need to do those. Um, we'll be working on that uh, to make it even a better effort. But uh, kudos to everybody on that, uh, that group of folks on the on the ground and the administrative end of things. Uh, really worked well um, in short time under really um, difficult situations. Thanks to those guys. The other thing is the expansion of bears out on the prairie is just um, going to continue. Um, we're seeing bears, you know, all the way out the list down now uh, consistently. It's not a, it's not a one off, and and we're done with that. Um, we're going to have to take a real hard look at um, where those bears are, what issues we're going to have to deal with with those when they're in the Missouri River breaks. They can just disappear, but I don't think they're coming back to the front. We know that they're pending out there on the prairies in many places, so that'll be a new uh, expanding challenge that we're going to have to look at and see how we're going to deal with conflicts, um, the presence out there, prevention, education, um, with our already stretched thin um, staff out there and the workload we're seeing on the front. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with all that new stuff. And then legislative sessions coming up uh, for the state of Montana. Um, just be aware of that and, and watch for bills that come out. Basically, who's the bears and uh, what the state looks at. So that's mine. Hey. Okay. Um, well, first off, I want to thank uh, my staff in the region, especially uh, Lori and Cecily for answering countless questions from me and trying to get up to speed in this new role and just learning the insane amount of knowledge and detail and depth that there is in these recovery plans and and i i'm really trying to make myself a study of it i i don't like not knowing things but you seem to be pretty good at it uh, and so thank you guys i uh, really appreciate that uh, as well as our conflict folks of you know educating me on on the nuances of uh, bear management and conflict and uh, which are a little different than what I was dealing with as a warden captain previously. So thank you guys. And I will continue to ask questions. 
that's probably a good thing. But my update, I wanted to just focus on uh, a project that we have uh, that we're working on as part of the Montana Great Outdoors project, which is a, a conservation easement um, that we're looking at that we actually were awarded $20 million through the Forest Legacy Program. And so we're finalizing, this is kind of an update on this phase of it. Uh, so we're finalizing this easement, which is going to permanently preserve 117,000 acres of lands that fall in between, like the, the, as Jim would call it, the spaces in between, which is very critical to have between the NCDE and the Cabinet Act and Selfworks as well. It ties right in with the uh, Lost Trail Conservation Easement that I mean, everybody is probably well aware of, which is another 100 some more thousand acres for our easement, but it permanently protects these lands. And it's a, that, that it allows for that connection between the NCDE and the Cabinet Act, where it's just sitting right in there and then subsequently the cell perk. So we're, we're in that process. We're finalizing uh, the, uh, well, we're finalizing our negotiations with Green Diamond and Southern Pines that are the, you know, the newer owners of what used to be Warehouser and Concrete. Um, and then we'll continue to work on the appraisals. The EA work is ongoing. Uh, but we anticipate closure on this uh, in the fall of 2023. And that's pending you know, approval from our Fish and Wildlife Commission. And it also has to be approved by the end. It's a dollar amount, like a million dollars. It's the, the bar to go to the land board. But we have, and I think what everybody probably already knows, but you can, you can have, in my mind, you can have the best science in the world and the best plans in the world. but if you don't have the political will to stand things up uh, and the relationships with uh, the communities, um, you're not going to get things done. And in this case here, we have county commissioners that are you know, local level, uh, the communities, the commissioners, the, the municipalities themselves, and everybody is just is really uh, on board with seeing this, maintains a working force, keeps the development from happening, and hopefully, uh, no, I'm not going to say anything about Yellowstone. TV show. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, that's that's kind of my update. We do have two more in the hopper that we're going to make applications for Forest Legacy, for more easements on more green diamond timber lands in the Thompson River area, which uh, hopefully those will score out high because again, that's more connection for uh, migration for us and just preserves those uh, habitats out there without developments. Thanks, ladies. Any, any update from Ken or Zimbo? Yeah. All right, switching gears. Uh, Kevin. Hello, everybody. Um, and yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say if anybody has trouble with my name, please feel free to call me Tab as well. Um, again, I'm with USGS, the Northern Rocky Mountain Science Center, and and our our role in general with USGS is is uh, science um, and science support. So. Um, I wanted to give just a couple updates. Uh, one, first, I'll just get the sort of Yellowstone um, piece of it out of the way. So the IGBST team um, with US, the USGS part of that team in uh, down in Bozeman has, as Cecily reported, been working on uh, um, the IPM, um, the integrated population model for down there. And they're currently at the point of wrapping up the development of that and they're starting to work on the implementation of that. So using that um, improved approach for population um, monitoring. Um, then in, in this system, I, I work on a pretty wide variety of things uh, my team does. I'm trained as a quantitative wildlife ecologist with a, a large focus on spatial analyses um, and trying to integrate different components of that into uh, understanding population level processes. Um, and so we've been uh, most recently starting to work again on this, um, the grizzly bear using the genetic data set, the long-term genetic data set in, in Glacier National Park, working on um, evaluating uh, things like the effects of fire on grizzly bear density over time, um, working with the park on that. Um, we also were, have been working with that data set, uh, the black bear component of that data set, specifically to look at connectivity. So using an approach called a spatial capture recapture model 
and um, using that to actually estimate connectivity around the US Highway 2 corridor. Um, in general, that's part of a larger group of, that's part of a larger group of projects that we've been working on um, in an interagency sense um, in collaboration with Glacier National Park. And then um, there is also, I had, uh, my team had been working on a variety of Huckleberry work, and there uh, are a couple of papers that we're working on that are, um, again, focused on Huckleberries as keystone species. Um, those are still pretty early in development, but I'll share those as they come out. It might be a slow process. I'm not sure yet at this point. And then um, finally, I also just wanted to remind people that there was an, a master's student who was working with some of the hairs from the genetic study. Um, I haven't been able to get an update on that, uh, on any progress on that, um, but just wanted to remind you that project existed. So happy to answer any questions or to move on to the next person. All right, I should say if any members have questions, we can just raise your hand and let me know. Yeah. We'll go through again public comment maybe at the end so we're going to hold off on that now um dave hey uh good to see you all again um sorry i couldn't be there in person uh really uh would have liked to have uh engaged in uh, the very rich discussion during the meeting and uh and seen some of you guys um outside of the meeting as well it's really good Oh, I should say I, I'm I'm new to this group. Uh, arriving at Glacier in uh, in just uh, July this past summer, so uh, uh, this will be the first of of many. I hope it was really good to hear the discussion uh, and the comments um, in the meeting yesterday and today, uh, especially recognizing the recreational growth uh, on the Crown. I'm very cognizant of Glacier's role. Uh, within the PCA of uh, of uh, uh, dealing with all the interest that people have in in, uh, in being here, uh, and it was nice to hear yesterday um, the progress with communities in Whitefish and, and Columbia Falls, uh, a, a community that I live in, and I kind of saw from the other side on Facebook comments the resistance towards the ordinance, but. Uh, I learned a lot from yesterday's presentation, hearing uh, the perception that it uh, seems to have been working and that there was some uh, some compliance there. Um, as far as the park update, um, uh, Glacier expects to have uh, uh, managed access in some form or fashion again in 2023, continuing our pilot. Um, wildlife and, and, and bears are part of these considerations into uh, into that managed access. Uh, although the the tool that we use probably looks pretty rough. Uh, it's it's easier to count vehicles uh, and parking spaces. Um, and so that's the the tool that we use primarily is vehicle reservations. Um, uh, look for more information on that. I, I hope in the next couple of weeks uh, for some some guidance and certainty as to what recreational access will look like in the park in summer 2023. Um, and last, I just want to uh, uh, thank uh, our park staff, our, our tribal partners, our agency partners for all the collaboration and communication that we do throughout the year. Uh, John and Steve have been on the calls yesterday and today for Glacier. Thanks, guys. And uh, other members of the committee, I look forward to more opportunities to, to work with you. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Any member questions for Dave? All right, switching gears to the Forest Service. I'll go ahead and start. Um, we did put in place, I shared at the spring meeting, we did put in place a uh, all encompassing food closure order for every national forest. Uh, our regional forester, Leanne Martin, signed that. We do anticipate moving forward with that again. It was for one year, kind of a trial aspect. I didn't hear it in feedback that didn't go well, so my assumption is we're going to roll that right over and make it probably a five or ten year food storage order. Um, if you all, if other agencies want to take a look at that, uh, we did do a lot of collaboration trying to come up with that language. So if if you all are interested, I can share that. Um, again, from my perspective and why I helped uh, push that across the boundary is is our recreating public doesn't necessarily see boundary lines. So again, trying to have something consistent, I thought was 
was uh, important, and I was really proud that that uh, Leanne Martin uh, kind of passed that on, and I feel like it was a success this last year. So again, if other agencies are interested, want to align with some of the language uh, we used, uh, let me know. I can send that on to you all. Um, but it does, we do anticipate uh, rolling that over and probably doing a five or 10 year foreclosure with that. Um, I will say I am extremely happy while we say all this recreation growth and everything else. I am super uh, happy that it seems like we are still having an expanding population. And so that is pretty cool to see uh, moving forward. Not to say there's not challenges with that, but uh, pretty exciting to see that the bear population is continuing to at least be stable, if not growing. And we're seeing expansion on top of all the recreation use that we've seen in the last um, however many years and the growth that we've seen on the Flathead National Forest alone is, is pretty impressive. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, lawsuit, we do have two uh, lawsuits in regards to bear. One uh, was on our forest, well, I guess both of them are on our forest plan. Um, we work with Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, had a new biological opinion issued for our forest plan on the Flathead uh, that is being appealed to the 